well, maybe that will cause some sort of traffic strife and they're worried about it. I'm going to watch it from my porch. Yeah, there you go. Easy peasy. You know, my offspring number one is in Indiana. Oh, and yeah. And he's going to be right underneath it. And he said the University of Indiana gave out like 40,000 pairs of these goggles. Oh. The glasses. Isn't that great about being at a university? My daughter's in Indiana as well. And I'm hoping that she's not in class when that happens. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know. It's like, all right, Jim paid his tuition today. So let's buy everybody glasses. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Anyway, um, so we got jolts coming out. We got some data coming. Let's take a look at the economic releases we're up against today. Tom. We have some stuff coming out. We do, we do. So 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., that, uh, you know, fabled 10 a.m. bar, uh, we've got two pieces of data, factory orders and jolts. Uh, job openings, what is it, labor turnover survey. That comes out at 10 o'clock. That could be actually an impactful uh, report. Uh, we also have a bunch of speakers today. We have Michelle Bowman speaking at uh, 1010, right after the news events, uh, 1010. She's a board. She's on the board of uh, the, the Fed, on the board of governors. We also have New York Fed president at noon speaking, uh, John Williams at noon. And then we have Loretta Mester just shortly after that, five minutes later. She's the Cleveland Fed president. So a bunch of speakers. Um, and and not to forget Mary Daly in San Francisco at 1.30. So we've got four Fed uh, speakers, three presidents, one governor, all within the uh, span of a, a couple of hours. And then we have our weekly API st oil stocks uh, report that comes from the API, kind of a precursor to the EIA report that comes out tomorrow. You compare com contrast, that might give us some insight. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at 10 o'clock, you know, those two numbers will be significant. And then, of course, um, if Fedpalooza continues, I think that this week there was like something like 16 or 17 speeches by FOMC members and governors and bank CEOs, uh, all related to the Federal Reserve. So there's going to be a lot of that chatter. Most of it's probably going to cancel each other out. And um, I think the theme so far has been, hey, you know, we're in a good spot now. You know, the economy is still, you know, trugging along. Um, employment's still pretty good. Everyone's kind of assimilating these higher rates. Um, however, some of these now casts, Tom, are starting to trickle into the one handles for GDP for first quarter. Yeah, we were talking about that yesterday. Um, you know, I did want to point out back to the, the speakers, we have a new Fed president as of, I think today, a new St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank president. His name is Alberta, and I'm going to butcher the last name, Musalem, uh, M-U-S-A-L-E-M, Musalem, Musalem. He's replacing Kathleen O'Neill uh, Peace. She was an interim president. Yeah. So uh, she'll be speaking on uh, Thursday along, I think before he speaks, it'll be kind of a, maybe a handoff. So interesting that we have an ex-president going out new president coming in and they're actually most likely speaking together. Um, so that's on Thursday, but that's just like you said, there's, there's probably a dozen or more different speakers, uh, let alone speaking events, right? Cause some of these speakers speak twice, three times during the week. Bostic is prolific, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> It would be like it would it would be like if me and you were like Fed Fed presidents. <laughs> We'd be out there talking every day. <laughs> I don't want to oh, think about that. My oh my goodness! All right. Well, now that we got that out of the way, ten o'clock is on my radar screen. Let's kind of check out some of these uh, longer term charts right here. I'll pull up a daily mini S and P chart uh, right off the bat, and we'll take a peek. I have to move my coffee cup to the right hand side so I don't knock it off on my keyboard, Tom. But the bull uh, bull market's in play. Still, although we're having a retracement happening right this second. Right. The the retracement kind of still fits in this uptrend we've been in. Um, <clears throat> although it did break below your eight eight period moving average. Yeah. Uh, you know, so what do we look for? We look for support. Where can we find it? Possibly at the 21. You know, we see that when it's substantially broken below the eight in the past, it looks like the 21 has, has acted as a safety safety net during this uptrend. Uh, but today looking very bearish. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sound the alarms 
just yet, right? I think it's it, it would be a natural kind of retracement. Um, first, the beginning of the second quarter, 2024, we were talking about pol- portfolio rebalancing before. Um, we're talking about profit taking at the end of the first quarter. Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons why this could be happening um, outside of this whole idea of what earnings are going to be and what they're projected at, which is a topic we're going to talk about with uh, Blue Putnam later on today. Uh, so I would just so in, with that in mind, I would draw a fib line, right? And I'm going to start here at this low peak where this the recent little I don't know rally started, right? And I'll move it over to the right hand side so we can see it. We'll just go uh, high to low, just again, just to see if we have any short term areas of interest. Fifty two fifty is certainly uh, right in the middle there of that retracement. Yeah, and look at the how how nicely that lines up with previous resistance i i just think that's you know a, a great level you can almost imagine that horizontal line and the market kind of flips right it it hits up against that resistance gets through and now maybe it's going to test it again on the other side and act as support we'll see right and tom i think what you're referring to is here we had resistance on the 11th 12th etc etc et cetera. we broke through we blasted through sideways again now we're coming back to test this resistance rectangle i'm putting a rectangle there is now support and it lines up with that 50 percent retracement everything is hunky-dory in the world the next thing to worry about is 62.5 percent which is 52 30 give or take a couple of ticks um, and that's lining up with that next 21 day moving average right there exponential moving average so again a couple of areas potential on the downside here this is looking bearish today yeah, we could take a little more heat and still be in an uptrend for sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So let's keep moving here. NASDAQ down 100. Let's go to the micro NASDAQ time down 184. So that's pretty material. That's that's uh, something exciting. Same same story, kind of. Let's go ahead and open this chart up a little bit more so we can see it a little bit better. I have a opposite trend line, though, Tom, top to bottom. Still, you know, still can't get above that, right? Um, it's hit that 21 period moving average, 21 day moving average. So, you know, it's a little more advanced on the retracement than the E mini SP. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's not like some kind of triangle or wedge I could draw here just to kind of uh, take a peek at what that would look like. Um, you know, I, again, this is kind of a loosely fitting idea I just did up here, but you know, sometimes it's good to throw these ideas up and just talk about them. Right. So I don't know if this is a triangle wedge or whatever you call it, Tom. And I don't even know how accurate it is, but you know, this is kind of where we started off at a you know, nice area support down here back at the end of February around eight, 850, 860, 17, 850, 860. So I started that line, touched it nicely to the top, I, I, you know, so that could kind of give us some framework. Yeah, for sure. If that 21 fails, you've got another support area. And it's supported by those lows that we saw, like you said, early March, mid-March. It's a perfectly fine trend line. And yeah, I would call it a wedge. Um, the triangle aspect, generally you like to have a flat edge to the triangle, right? A horizontal line, yeah. ascending, descending. Doesn't always work that way, but um, I like the wedge here a little bit better. So I'm going to give it a 7.5. I mean, that's a, that's a solid C, right? That's a solid C. I would say it's better than that. I would, I would up it to maybe an 81, 8.1. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a B minus. I can a, for, a for effort. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's keep moving here, folks. Let's go to the Dow. Dow is down a whopping 320. Um, so not off to a good start to so far this morning. Let's take a peek at that daily chart. Again, trend is up pretty strong. You know, I'm. This is looking a little bit closer to the E mini S and P uh, with a retracement in play right now. I'd probably do this retracement about the well, a couple of places you could do it. I, you know, you could start it here. You could start it here. You know, I don't know if you have a preference, Tom. Um, I would probably go a little bit deeper. Yeah. So, so yeah, that that's perfectly fine. You know, the longer you go back, the more time you might have to have it play out. Right. So. You know, you're going back to the beginning of March. That's a month. Um, if you were to go to that level you first identified, that's about half a month, two weeks. So, you know, it, it really is 
you know, the longer you go back, the more data ha you have, the bigger the range, the bigger your targets. So you got to give it a little more time. I like that. I like that one month look back. Oopsie. So here's the other thing I, I meant to ask you, Tom. Yesterday, if I'm, if I'm, yesterday we had this target wick up here around 341. Right. right. That's a, that's the all time high, right? Yeah. And, and then within one and a half sessions, within one and a half sessions from that all time high, you know, we're tracking 571. So we're right. down quite, I don't even know what the math is there. I mean, it's like 700 points from that peak high, right? And then to this low. And when you look at this chart, you say, wow, this is now we're in a, you know, the top is in, we're in a bear market. But remember, this was yesterday. Right. <laughs> This was, you know, there's just the PMI data yesterday, right? So again, I'm attributing some of this to the beginning of the second quarter, rebalancing and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and look at that pattern. You've got a nice M pattern. And I think uh, Jason would, would agree with this. Jason at Mission Control, you've got an M pattern, which is market advances past your your resistance. Exactly. You, well, you, we've had that before, right? We had it in the end of February. We had another M pattern. Um, we probably had it once or twice more in this in this uptrend since October. So, you know, we do have these pullbacks, and they're not showing signs of yet of this uptrend being threatened. Right? It may pull back a little more. I know I've heard people calling for more of a pullback. Right. Yeah, you can double click there. It'll there you go. And you know, it's what's gonna happen next. We get support at the 21, maybe. We see a ret retracement, we see advancement past the top of that uh, you know, that that uh, ice uh, mohawk wick that you've you've identified. So that could happen. It's not out of the woods. This is looking pretty pretty bearish for two bars, right? It's it's undone that advancement. But we already did that before, and we turned right back bullish. So, yeah. So, uh, all right. So, double top, maybe M formation. Is this something that you and Jason discovered, or is this a? No, it's it's something that I think Jason Jason had. Uh, 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 I don't know if he discovered it, but certainly I heard it from Jason first. Not something that was on my radar, and Jason turned me on to it. All right. Well, there you go. So we'll see if the M is completed, right? That's the idea. And we got that moving average. So still though, I'm not bullish this morning in this market. For sure. For sure. All right. Let's shoot over to Russell 2000. Russell 2000. Uh, I still have my trend channel there, Tom. I, I drew it starting all the way back at the beginning of February. Um, hopefully that doesn't cloud the situation up a little bit, but we have this, you know, last two sessions, big red bar systematic. This is systematic price action folks. They're, you know, for all the stock index futures. And, um, again, we're between those, the eight and the 21, uh, exponential. Yeah. It sounds like the other three markets we just looked at, right. We're, we're seeing if 21 will hold the support. It's very bearish today. So if you're thinking bullish, if you're thinking, you know, that's a, counter trend trade today do you do you want to you know different things happen when you're doing co counter trends than going with the trends yeah looking looking fairly bearish where will we find support you know there like you're identifying right there there was a lot of congestion mm -hmm. so couple couple reasons why this might be support yeah and this was a couple days ago so you know the sky is not falling people <laughs> yeah yeah, the sky is not falling. This is a couple of days ago, we're still higher than we were a couple of days ago. So, any event, you know, today though, the bias I think is is a little bit negative going into the open anyway. Ah, oh, boy, uh, Jim. Uh, but before yeah. we go to the next chart, I do want to remind everybody about the contest that we have going on. It's our first contest <clears throat> with the new format of the live streams. Uh, one of the things we can do is we can try new things, and this week we have a guess the close. Uh, uh, contest. You can see it on the screen. Take a snapshot uh, that has all the details. But the gist of it is guess the close of the E mini uh, SP June contract for Thursday, 415 settlement price. We will use that as our uh, barometer 
And if you can get those entries to learn at NinjaTrader.com before midnight Pacific time tonight, uh, you will be eligible to win a swag pack as long as you're in the U.S. I think I covered everything. Yeah, you did. So now, but now your your guess has to be submitted by uh, my, what is today? Today's by by tonight, tonight. midnight tonight. Yeah. yeah, right. It's easy to do, folks. Learn at NinjaTrader.com. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we'll see who has uh, got their their longer term forecast in tuned. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm submitting mine. I've, I'm not telling you what it is yet, and I right. I haven't submitted it yet. And when I do, I'll, I'll I will tell you what it is once I go ahead and hit that send button. Yeah, me too. Me too. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, and Mike Burke uh, will be on to talk about it tomorrow as well. Yeah. So and it, it you know it, there's two really things going on here, right? Guess the close, and then beating Jim and Tom. Now that shouldn't be too hard, right? <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness yeah. anyway it's a lot of fun i like the swag too the, swag, the giveaway stuff is pretty cool yep all right let's keep moving folks let's go 10-year note 10-year note is selling off big time uh bonds are selling off big time this is the second big sell-off in a row um this is again a little bit smarter market and this is suggesting rates higher for longer um, that's what I'm, that's my takeaway here. We have a double bottom. First time we attempted to get into my rectangle back here was at the end of February. Uh, we're doing it again today, touching it really nicely here. Um, I, this is a, this is a really keen area support. This will be hard to break through. I don't want to suggest that we can't, but it's going to be hard, uh, to break through. And I do expect a change in temperature. If some of these employment numbers start rotating the other way. <laughs> Right, and we have a lot of a lot of re, uh, employment numbers coming out this week, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, when everything settles. You know, finishing with the un, un, unemployment report on Friday, so it'll be interesting to see kind of what the market thinks after all these numbers come out. Yeah, for sure. I, I, you know, and Jolts is a little Jolts has really got a lot of data in it. it. You know, we're talking quits, we're talking separations that weren't quits, we're talking layoffs, we're talking openings. There's all sorts of data that's going to come out at 10 o'clock. I can't wait to read that report. Right. And right now it's forecast to be a little bit lower than than last report. So last month, or should I say the previous month, um 8.86 million was the previous. Uh, it's forecast to be 8.76. So if it comes in higher uh, or, you know, really off that mark on the low side, that might have implications for, for all markets. Absolutely. It's going to be an important number for sure. Now, Tom, one thing I did just for fun. Yeah. Is this the right chart? Yeah. So I did an overlay chart. It's really easy to do with, um, with the NinjaTrader software. And uh, what I did was I overlaid a candle, even the S&P candle chart. This is a daily. You could do it on an intraday, a weekly, whatever you want. Um, so I have the, the regular E-mini S&P daily candle. And then I overlaid uh, the 10-year note. Uh, I did an open, high, low, close just to, so you could see some contrast uh, on, the, on the show. And I have on the left-hand side here, we have the 10-year uh, note scale. On the right-hand side, we have the S&P uh, scale. And then the panel, the, at the bottom panel, I added a correlation calculation based on 60 days. And you can see what the correlation between these two markets uh, are right now. I love it. And I always, I, I've always liked these charts. And I, I thought it's an awesome chart that you made here. Um, what we look for in these charts is we look for trends. So uh, you're looking to see when... Uh, the e-mini S&P, the market, the stock market goes up. What do what do treasuries do? What does the, the um, in this case, the 10-year do? Does it trend with it or does it kind of do the opposite? Now, one thing to be careful with is we don't get a, side, a, sign, uh, a sense of magnitude, right? All we see is a chart going up and a chart going down. So um, the correlation takes care of that issue. Right, because correlation is all about performance. It's if the market goes up one percent, how much does the, the do bonds go up, or do they go down? Right? Do they go negative? Do they go the other way? So that's in percentage. You know, they're they're comparing the performance, not the not necessarily the price. Well, they are using price to make that comparison. So the correlation is great 
for taking care of the issue of, you know, I don't know if that uh, S and P chart just looking at like this. I don't know if it's a five percent move, a ten percent move, versus the bonds could be a one percent move or a half a percent move. It doesn't give me a sense of of magnitude, but it does give does give me a sense of do they trend together? Do they not trend together? Correlation takes care of it. I love this chart. Yeah, and the you know when I saw this for the first time. Well, when I saw it this morning, I made it this morning. I'll be honest. I woke up early. I get up early, Tom. You know, when you're my <laughs> age, you start getting up early no matter what. But right. anyway, right. Um, but you saw this was like positively. I'll just go back to 2023, just just really quickly. Uh, July two positively correlated. They're going the same. You know, they're going the same way. But then the calculation is 60 period, so it's backward. So it takes a while to catch up to that correlation. So keep that in mind the, I have a 60 period here, which is a 60 day correlation calculation. You could make it, you could make, you know, that's two months, right? Uh, or no, wait, two, three months, right? Quarter. You right. could make it whatever you want an experiment with, you know, what helps you, but in any event, you could kind of see in addition to the correlation number itself, what it looks like on a chart. So, you know, it's, it's, it's correlated one period it's uncorrelated the next after a long period of time. But like you, to your point, Tom, it does trend nicely. And there's and these trends are pretty uh, interesting to see side by side, right? And and I think we were talking about why you know if you pull in a little more data, you see a point where it kind of also separates. You know, it was separate there, right there, yeah. So there is some behavior mm -hmm. that is similar, right? It peaks at the same time, it it troughs at the same time, but then it's it's almost like well, bonds are going to continue to rise, and and e minis take a take a um, retracement right so there's these times where they they're in in cahoots they're not in cahoots and to me it's all about kind of fed expectations getting back to it because interest rates are so pegged to these these markets that maybe it's uncertainty where they trend together and when there's certainty a little more certainty they say okay this is what we're supposed to be doing markets going up uh stock markets going up bonds are are going down and that's the way it's been since the beginning of the year. Yeah. And so I'm going to, you know, we also talk about risk on risk off, right? And you see, like, I'm just going to draw a loosely fitting line here. This is both of them are going down, right? Both of them are going up. Money's leaving both of these, right? So right. money money in means pressure up, money out means pressure down. Uh, and I'm talking about the cash market and the futures files to cash, they're related. And so when you see these kind of trends, you can start thinking about risk on risk off. Right. And, and, you know, that coincides with when we stopped raising rates, right? End of July was the last rate hike. Look what happened to both markets. Boom. Yeah. 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 Good point. Good point. So later on today, uh, I think we'll have time later on today. I'll show you how to make one of these. It's really easy and you can compare any two markets you want uh, with the Ninja Trader software. I think it's very effective on any time frame. So um, just wanted to share that a little bit. Tom. And by the way, uh, well, Actually, we're getting close to the opening range here. So we are going to take that break here in a couple of seconds, folks. Appreciate everybody being here today. We'll get to the chatters. Appreciate you being a chatter. Uh, Tom, I think we could uh, go ahead and take a really quick break right now, and we'll get back right back to it. Awesome. So you want to be a trader. Well, you should know you're not alone. Over the past several years, record numbers of people have set up their very own online trading accounts. There's never been an easier time or more inexpensive way for do-it-yourselfers to get started trading the financial markets. Better futures start now with the Ninja Trader mobile app. With the power to customize how you trade on the go, you can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at ninjatrader.com.
We are back going into the opening range Ninja Trader Live. My name is Jim Cagnina, and we have Tom Schneider side by side with me this morning. Hey, Tom, we have some uh, first in the chat today. We do. Uh, first in the chat, we have two of them because we have two locations to chat Gen P and the Lieb, or the Lieb, I'm going to say both. Uh, but thank you for being the first ones in the chat. You get a special shout out. I'm going to guess Gen P was the first in the Ninja Trader chat, and the Lieb was the first in the YouTube. Uh, that's just a, a educated guess, but regardless of where you are, thank you for, for being the first ones in the chat and you can join us. If you're watching on YouTube, the chat's enabled. Uh, if you want to join us at ninjatrader.com, just go to ninjatrader.com forward slash events, hit the play button, put in a handle, drop in questions, comments, trade ideas, uh, whatever's on your mind. We'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, absolutely. Appreciate you guys being here. And if, if by any chance, a small remote chance that the Lieb is Lieb Schaefer, Lieb, it's good seeing you. That's probably not, but it's worth it. It's worth a chance, worth a chance. Um, let's go to gold Tom. I mean, it continues, it continues, it continues. This rally is pretty powerful. Um, really no end in sight at this point. I'm bullish here as well. We had that extension, Tom, uh, this uh, Poly H extension that I put up on the screen, and we just achieved 61.8% today. Well, yesterday, right. but we're trading in it today. So uh, the Poly H extension, let's, let's, so people might want to use it. It's Fibonacci extension. And uh, all, all we're doing is we're measuring the previous up move, and you can determine what which up, up move you want to use. Um, and applying it to the current uptrend, right? So uh, we break that up into Fibonacci levels and we apply it to the current uptrend and we might see some resistance or support based on those levels. Now, what's interesting, I think about yesterday is we had big move up and sellers came down and knocked the market down, but it gave us a target, gave us a target uh, on the high, which um, interesting open today, right? I mean, it just kind of gapped open you know, uh, from the close yesterday to to the next session, you know, that hour gap really gave us a big lift and and we even achieved a higher a higher high today, but uh, backed off a little. I was looking at an evening star uh, uh, reversal yesterday, possible reversal, but I think buyers just lifted that market too high. You know, they got a taste and they want to come back. Yeah, I mean, that was right. I, you would call it an evening star. I'm calling it a potential turnaround doji. Um, although it was a little high up on the, on the, uh, related to the previous body and it had a huge wick on the top uh, yesterday. Seller said no more. And so that's why, like, I don't know about you, but I'm surprised uh, we're having this high wick right here. I mean, I really am surprised we have that high wick right there based on that previous day's candle. Right. Now, this could be, you know, there was some news coming out over the, you know, in the evening about inflation. Uh, I think German German inflation came in a little little colder than expected, you know, but there were some other numbers that came in a little hotter. So maybe it's just all this taken into consideration. People want to be in gold. Yeah. And there is also a lot of conflict in the world these days, unfortunately. Yep. So a lot of combinations here, right? And, I, and this is going to be the topic for Dan Gramsa. He's coming up a little later on this morning, and we're going to really focus on gold and silver and metals. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll have a better understanding after I, after he's done. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Always. <laughs> yeah. So in any event, um, let's shoot over to crude oil, right? I, right. We're looking for places to buy gold. As we're I'm bullish right now. Crude oil, crude oil. Whoopsie. Let me fix my little guy here. Crude oil. That chart percolate, and there it is. Well, it looks kind of similar, Tom, breaking out again, although a little less traumatic. We had that nice rally, that breakout, hit uh, resistance sideways, another rally, breakout. Um, crude's uh, approaching that 85 handle right now. And Jim, you could use that same Fibonacci extension here. It's looking a lot like gold, right? A big move up, retracement, and then um, I would go. I would go to the previous uptrend from 77. That would be really? my thing. Well, all right. Well, let's do this one okay. first. Yeah, this one's okay. a bigger one, right? That's a good good idea. Oh, yeah. But you're right. Yeah. We're, we're way above that 61.8. So that's not that helpful to us. 
Right. And although you, one would say, well, there's your target, Jim, 86.34. And I'd say, yeah, that yes. sounds good. Okay. But uh, let's go ahead and do it uh, according to uh, the world, according to Tom Schneider. I'm going to go to, <laughs> I didn't call you Garp though. Right. Where, where, should I, where should I start? So do you see right around the 11th, 12th? Yeah, right there. Exactly. Yay. Low. This yeah. is touch point one, touch point, point two. two. Touch point three is here, but I'm going to pull it over to the side. Correct. There we go. Still pretty advanced, right? Yeah. And what's our yeah. target on this one? Pretty close to the same. 86.59 right. on the upside. Yep. You know, we wicked through 76.4. These are pure fib numbers. 100%. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with open sky, yeah. right? There's, you know, it's it's an open sky. You don't, there's nothing up there, right? You can go way right. back in time and see something up there, but contemporary, you know, recent, right? Recent six months, nothing there. And so now it's like, all right, how high could it go, right? And then what tools do you have? Well, you have these kind of fib tools. And this is right. When you have open sky, this is more of a target. This isn't something where I would expect resistance, right? I wouldn't expect resistance there. You could <clears throat> blow through that 86.58 or whatever it is. I would round it down 8650 nice clean number probably some options associated with that number so there might be some interest there but you know this is a target if you're if you're bullish which i am on gold um just based on you know the behavior now um why not you know if you go long that might be a target and then you can figure out you know uh, um, you know, do you, do you add to the target? Do you add to the position rather as you break 76.4% retrace or, or advanced, you know, all these different things are in consideration. Yeah. And this was, I mean, last year we were $95, right? So this isn't, this isn't, you know, the sky has fallen kind of thing, right? right? This is, yeah, we'd like it to be 75. We'd like it to be 72. We'd like it to be lower, but you know, we have, uh, you know, we have a, we were, you know, the, the supply chain supposedly is fixed. We have economies that are still with positive GDP. We have, you know, full employment. We have policies at OPEC plus that hasn't really changed. We have policies here in the U S that really hasn't changed. So all of these kind of come to one equation and that's a, a little bit higher crude oil prices. And, and tomorrow we have an OPEC meeting. Yeah. So this might be anticipation of what's going to come out of that meeting. Well, right. And OPEC plus meetings are, are notorious for leaking information. So right. we're going to, it's because the meeting themselves usually last like, in time I was shocked when I, when I heard this, many of those meetings, not all of them, but many of them last like six minutes, Oh wow. 10 minutes. <laughs> right. So they have it all set. Do you agree? Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. Nice seeing you. Right. And that's it. So a lot of the information is leaked ahead of time. I, you know, this might be different. I don't know, but um, keep that in mind because it's it's crazy how how brief these meetings are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Anyway, all right. One last one last one time. I really want to talk about where's my micro Bitcoin at. Um, this is another one. We're talking about risk on risk off money flow. This one I have my eye on. This we have the having coming up on the eighth. And we have a big sell off today. We broke through both of those, uh, both of those uh, exponential moving averages. Uh, we're at a 66, 65 handle print right now. Nice area support though, approximately uh, 63,950. Yeah, and, and right, 60, 63,950, 64,000. I mean, nice even number, kind of all happening at the same area. And then I'd be worried about that. Um, what is that? That. 50 day moving average is that what the blue one is the, the blue one is the um 50 exponential exponential okay so yep. a 50 exponential you know if we if we fail to fail to hold this uh rectangle that you've drawn then we're looking at the 50 and and this can happen in the matter of a day a session or two right i mean Look at that hot dog bun over on the left. You had a pretty wide trading range, right? 10,000, I think, was the range, maybe more. So, you know, these these levels can be achieved in, in one session. Yeah, no, for sure. Especially in this particular market, it's very, very vol volatile. Now, you know, if, you're, if you are trading, if you're day trading or even position trading, Bitcoin, I don't know why you're not doing it in futures. You should be doing it in futures. You can go short, you can go long, it's margined properly. 
um, all of that stuff. Be careful of leverage, but um, this is a great market to be in. So, and then yep. don't disregard it's my, it's, this is the micro Bitcoin, but you could do two, four or five micros and there's a lot of meat on the bone, Tom. Yep. Yep. So in any event, I just wanted to uh, point that one up. I know the opening range is kicking in right now. We could pull up some 10 minute charts, but more importantly, who is here with us today? Oh, right. We got a great group as usual. When we talk about that, we're talking about the chat. So uh, shout outs for Boston, Jay, Cospi, Nick E. That seems like a new new chatter. Thanks for coming. Anissa, good afternoon. Build Back Broker. I think one of our, our more uh, humorous <clears throat> handles. Love that. For Money is here. Long time, long time chatter. Chad Rowe, Yovan, Polly H., Mom and Dad Cags, good morning. Dave L, Raleigh, Eagle, Bo Hunter, Ryan Waters, Chris Cags, Avi, Dan G, Sergio BV, J Man 2005, Brandon N, Mundi Altec. Thank you all for coming to the chat. Uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate your participation and your questions as well. Some great questions like Boston J. Boston Jay has a great question today. Um, any news drop around 8.30 today because of the big move that we saw at that time? Yeah, I mean, my crosshair is there right now. I, you know, I I don't know. I, did you find, did you see anything that, stu that stuck out at your time? I, I did not. I didn't see anything that, that really was uh, jumping out. I, I look at Financial juice as uh, Forex Factory is more for the economic stuff, but it's great. Uh, Mike Mike Burke turned me on to that one. I like that site as well. Um, looked at Zero Hedge. I don't have a subscription to Bloomberg anymore. Otherwise, I would look at that, of course. Um, but I did not see anything. There were no economic reports that came out at eight thirty um, that would explain, you know, kind of a move based on a number. So. You know, I, I don't know what this would be. You know, S1, this could be purely technical. You know, at 8.30, we were trading at S1. It was holding a support. And then when it falls, where did it go to? It went to S2, kind of in a hurry. So I don't, I don't know. Well, the in most interesting part about this, in my mind, is we have a nice volume distribution overnight, right? Overnight, sideways action, VWAP is flat. A nice kind of a, a competing point of control. Uh, 5289, 5290, I'm rounding a little bit where my crosshairs is right now. And that was steady Freddy, even through the open of the European session, right? So European session opened up, Asian session, European session then opened up and it's like, okay, it's business as usual. And then we started trading below VWAP. And the first time we traded below volume weighted average price was if you have six o'clock this morning, and then it's been see you later ever since, right? So really, even though this was this was kind of uh, this, you know, 550 to six o'clock period was still within the overnight range. This is when it started, right? When, when we start, when we left VWAP and then we have a confirmation candle here at six to 610. And that at that point in time, the move was afoot, right? And then we just had to get through yesterday's lows, which we easily uh, did without hesitation. And it's not, this is, this could be a trend day down all day, uh, Tom. This is looking pretty gnarly. Right. And as, as S2 is failing to hold right now, now that might change. You know, the question is, where is S3 in my mind? So, you know, that's the, the next thing I look at. It's it's pretty deep down there, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's going down. I'm yelling timber. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was a bad pit, pit bull reference. Apologize. <laughs> Well, um, you know, the yeah. one thing to think about, if we do get down there, that would in indicate about twice the average true range. I mean, right now we're trading a little over the average true range for the E-mini. We're um, 47 is the average true range. So 52.47 would be top to bottom the average true range. We're at 42 and looking to go south even more, it looks. So that S3 is about twice the average true range, which the average true range has been ticking down, you know, over the course of how many months. So not, you know, if you said that today's a hundred handle day a year ago, wouldn't have been such an issue. Like, okay, it's kind of a nice day or, a, you know, bleak day, depending on which way you, you trade, but it's not out of the realm. Now we're, we're doing average range of half that. So, 
it seems like a big move and it is it is but we've had bigger moves so tom why is s3 so why is the distance between s2 and s3 so big compared to s1 and s2 so the calculation i mean the the answer is the answer is the math but s1 and s r1 if we if we pull the chart down just a little bit because we're using yesterday's data to calculate these levels yeah. what comes into play is yesterday's range high to low and you see it repeated throughout the sequence so if you look yep. at the move from s2 to s3 as we're we're tracking it now that's yesterday's range oh, i see okay and, and yep. we go to s2 to the pivot that's yesterday's range so why is s1 kind of not the next level well it's s1 to r1 is yesterday's range as well the calculation places it in such a such a way that it kind of favors the direction of where it closed yesterday. Um, and if you just did yesterday's range off the pivot, you would have three really um, difficult levels to achieve, right? If S2 were really S1 and S3 were really S2, then S3 in the new way would be really S4. And and S1 right now is achievable. It's, it's kind of a, a probability thing. Okay. All right. That makes, that makes sense. What you just said for sure. I was okay. just, I was just All curious. Right. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yep. Get a little, I get a little free education every once in a while by asking time questions. <laughs> Where are my keys? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's today, Tuesday. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the key question. That's one for my wife. She's oh, okay. like, they're right in front of you. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, just <laughs> look down. I'm like, Oh, they're there. <laughs> Um, so anyway, this is a big sell-off today, folks. So, and, and the other thing is we're trading between the second and th the first and second lower standard deviation bands ever since. We've been just walking along, walking down the slope of that second VWAP standard deviation band all day long. So it could continue to be a good guide, although it looks like the bands are getting a little wider now, Tom, at the opening range. Right. And it's almost like uh, putting putting a carrot on a stick and attaching it to your dog, right? And, or a toy, right? As the dog chases it, that stick gets farther away. Um, the VWAP's the same way, right? As we trade down here, the VWAP's going to be pulled down. So the bands are going to be pulled down. So that second standard deviation might be a little harder to achieve now. Eventually, the volume will kind of dry up as we get away from the opening range. And those VWAP bands will be, you know, and the extreme a little more achievable. But um, right now, with all the volume coming in, yeah, it's not surprising that these bands are moving down at a at a good clip. Yeah, I'm wondering now is uh, you know is Fed Palooza gonna throw you know fan <laughs> the fire today or not? Or are they gonna calm calm things down? I don't know. You know, the the one thing I see is John Williams is speaking at noon. I'd be very careful around there. And then you've got Loretta Mester, you know, right after. So, you know, there's always the question too, are they in sync? Right? Are they are they saying, you know, what are what are their their if they're not in sync, what are those what are those comments that they're making that are slightly off, right? And and does that mean that there's something that has to be addressed by the Fed? All right, exactly. John Williams is usually the kind of the the cooler cooler heads prevail fed person yeah so he, he's a little bit more calm and a little bit you know you know and after all he's the president of the new york federal reserve bank which is where they actually run the dealing desk out of so um he's got you know you know he walks in that office every day and hey guys what's going on and he sees he sees what's going on have you been in that office or in, in that shouldn't say the office have you been in the building no yeah, I've been in the building. It's pretty nice. Yeah, no, I would like to go. Yeah. All right, let's kind of zoom around here. All the equities are down pretty big. Uh, Dow is down a lot. Let's keep going down here. Uh, bonds and notes are actually, uh, well, bonds are down a huge amount. Uh, Treasury bonds are down over a handle. The, the long bond, as Craig uh, Buell called it yesterday. Let's just take a peek at that market really quickly here. This is, again, 10-minute chart. Same kind of phenomenon. Let's see what time this does this start selling off at six o'clock. Also, uh, pretty close, maybe a little bit earlier. But you know, we broke the previous session's low, 
Uh, we tested it. It acted as it acted as support for pre you know, early, early, early market. I'll draw a rectangle right there really quickly just to kind of drive that point home. And um, then we finally broke out. Boom. Uh, you know, a good half an hour before uh, the equity market. So this kind of, again, you know, bond market is a little smarter. They see things ahead of time and they move a little bit in advance as well. And you can see the correlation now is positive between bonds uh, and the uh, and the equities because they're both selling off. Uh, big time. Nice point of control down here established around 117.13. Yeah, and these pivots, I keep coming back to them because they look like they are doing what they're supposed to do, which is attract orders, right? This is where traders are aware of these values. So they put in orders ahead of time. They have resting orders there possibly. You know, look at S1. S1 tested and just sat there for a little bit. Now S2, same thing, right? Yeah. So I'm just, again, curious if the market breaks below S2. Where is S3? Well, it'll be pretty far down there. Um, but, you know, just if, if, if it's really far down, right? If it's really far down, I've seen people put a halfway point in there. So like S2 and a half, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It could be an eyeball, right? That might be an area where where traders look at because S3 might not be achievable. Well, so I never considered S2.5. <laughs> That's it's, the first time, yeah. Yeah, it's really when there's a big move the day before. Because when you have a big day, move the, the day before, the pivots are going to be really wide. So let's give us a target that might be a little more reasonable. And maybe it's not S2 and a half, maybe it's S1 and a half. But today we we got to S2, so I'm curious about S2 and a half. Yeah, right. I'm looking at this chart and you know what comes to my mind? What's that? Are the upcoming employment numbers going to be so bad? The Fed's going to, or are they going to be so good? That's what's going through my mind right now. Right. Why does the bond market know that we don't know? But anyway, this is a huge sell off. I am not trying to find the bottom here. I don't know where the bottom is. No. Although we do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven candles in a row, right? That's almost an hour. No, is that right? Yeah, almost an, hour, an hour worth of support, uh, but we're selling, yeah. we're kind of driving through it again right now. So until we get another candle that's above the actual top of the rectangle, I'm not ready to say uh, we've hit a bottom yet in this market, and I'm certainly not going to do a counter trend trade and try to get long. Yeah, we'll know. You know, we'll know in about 12 minutes when that jolts number comes out if that's what the market was waiting for. You know, um, so I would not job, want to trade ahead of this either. Job openings, labor turnover survey coming yes. around the corner. That's right. Um, the the currencies though. Uh, Tom, are relatively mute today, right? We have, except for the euro actually is on the move. Everything else is almost unchanged. It looks green, right? It looks like the dollar's a little bit weaker with the exception of the Swissy. But uh, euro has got a 290 print at the end. Let's take a look at the euro effects. That is on the move. Euro effects versus the US dollar. Uh, again, if you're trading currencies, you should be trading futures currencies, not over the counter uh, currencies in my humble opinion. Um, and uh, we will help you get started. It's easy peasy. But here's the here's the euro FX versus the US dollar. Remember, the US dollar is in the denominator, which means it's weaker versus the uh, the euro right here. And we have some interesting volume bars down here at the bottom, Tom. Yeah. Now remember, Europe is coming back from a, a four day weekend, so the volume could reflect the fact that they were off for four days. You know, no 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 deals on Friday, no deals on Monday, for them. And they're getting their business done, uh, uh, you know, kind of as, a, you know, maybe three days worth of business in one day. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, Eric Noren told us Europeans love their vacations. <laughs> <laughs> we got to leak that memo to Ninja Trader CEO. <laughs> Have Eric oh. talk to talk to our yeah. CEO. But that's yeah, right. it's, so, so I think this could be just, you know, um, you know, order filling, right? Whatever, whatever those currency traders at, at the institutions are, are, you know, uh, whatever their directive is, whatever trades they have to execute because they execute on behalf of their institution, but also on behalf of, you know, large customers, they're getting those, those done. And, 
you know, it's one of those things where they're balancing, you know, filling orders versus moving the market, depending on how big those orders are. So it's, it, it isn't like a spike, right? There is a spike, like 410 bar, there was a big move, but there was a lot of volume before that and after that too. So, you know, yeah. that tells me that that's just business getting done after a four day weekend. Yeah, it could be. And that, you know, daylight savings is happening in both places. So it's not, you know, this isn't, this sell-off isn't because of that four o'clock. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, yep. I, the, we're at the top of the second standard deviation band on VWAP time. We're way, well above the pivot. Um, let's see where S1 is, R1 is rather uh, pretty far away right here. Um, so right now, um, I think that the dollar might trend a little less than everything else. I'd be looking for a top to be established here. It isn't yet, but, um, a couple more candles worth of data here and we could get my rectangle could survive. Let's, I'm going to throw it up there. We'll keep an eye on it and come back to it a little later. Yeah. I like that. If the news is, if the news means a stronger dollar, then we'll see a top here. But if it indicates a weaker dollar, you know, we know where our one is. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not advocating a counter trend trade yet, but what I am interested in is a retracement trade. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that fib line in right now. And again, the, uh, I'm going to just start it here at the, it, we're, you know, really where this recent trend started, right? Yep. Um, around 430 in the morning. And I'm going to go low to high, click once. I'll click again. So that target wick up there, target wicks matter, right? And now we're trying to retrace back down. We have a lot of room on the downside for, for retracement time. Um, but if we do get a decent retracement, say that 3750, depending on where the VWAP is, it might be an interesting uh, time to jump on this trend and get long again. Yep. Yep. By the way, Jim, I think we should remind everybody what's going on this week. Oh, yeah, for sure. We have a lot of stuff going on. We uh, Today, um, we have uh, up in a, in a couple segments here, we have... Dan Gramza is going to join me live. Our focus is going to be on silver and gold. Just remember, just remember, channel your inner Burl Ives, <laughs> silver and gold. Um, so that's Dan. We're going to be together a half hour. And then after that, we have Blue Putnam. And Blue is going to talk about the relationship between equities and Fed funds rate, which is what we all want to know about. Um, and then who's next, Tom? Who's after uh, Blue today? I can't wait to talk to Anthony Drager. We're going to be talking about support and resistance, kind of picking up where, where you and he uh, left off last week. Uh, support and resistance when they fail, when it doesn't go as, as planned. What's going on there? What are the dynamics? So I can't wait for that. And then, of course, we'll wrap it up. Mike Burke, myself, for the midday wrap-up. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Anthony. He's going to be happy to talk to you. He talked to me last week. He's going to be happier to talk to you. I, I, I don't know about I was, that. I was pushing back on, you know, he was ripping my fib, my fib extensions. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so, uh, no, good. Excited to see Dan and blue and then, uh, talk to Anthony and Mike. So great morning. Yeah. Anthony is one of my favorites. I, I, I he's, he, he's a pretty smart cat. Yep. Yep. Um, whew, boy, oh boy, this new format, uh, um, uh, type in your thoughts on the new format guys. Tough. Tell, tell us if you like it, you don't like it. Things we could do better, things we could do worse. Um, <laughs> you're right. And, uh, I love your feedback as usual. And th that's how we got here in the first place. So it's, uh, it's been an interesting week and a half and we've kind of, uh, you know, we had a couple behind the scene bugs we worked out, you know, mission control is brilliant. Uh, walking, walking me, you and Mike through this. It's been pretty good. J Jim, I don't want to correct you, but it's our third week. This is it is really? our third week of the new format. Yeah. It's, it's gone by so, so quick. The new normal. The new normal. By the way, uh, I don't want to remind everybody, too, we do have a Guess the Close contest, <laughs> our first contest in the new format. Uh, get uh, Basically, looking at the E-mini S&P for Thursday. Guess the Close for Thursday's E-mini uh, trading, 415 close. And you could win a surprise uh, swag package, an IndiaTrader swag package. Just send us your entry learn at ninjatrader.com is the email address put guess the close in the header or in the subject rather and you could even put your your guess in the subject as well uh, do that though by tonight at midnight pacific time and you will be entered to win the one who gets closest to 
will win the swag as long as they're in the United States. Absolutely. I'm getting ready to get my guests in time. Although with the sell-off, <laughs> it's going to make it a little trickier. I know. I know. I can't wait. Anyway, um, I switched over to gold, Tom. Gold we saw on the, you know, kind of extended that uh, um, trend up. We had a little bit of a pause yesterday. Uh, now this is the the 10 minute chart of gold. It looks like yesterday's high is is just there, just attracting attracting activity, right? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, double top, you know, we wicked through it before, we wicked through it again. This is pretty nice resistance right here. Now, this is a case where I would look to do a counter trend trade. I would look to see if we can get a drive back to that volume weighted average price right now. This is the uh, June 2024 contract uh, in gold. You could do this in a micro gold uh, contract as well. But the idea would be, hey, now that we have this uh, level of uh, resistance that's been established, it's pretty keen. There's a lot of areas of interest here. You have uh, yesterday's highs, you have a double top. We didn't even get close to R1. We have a 12.5% uh, uh, harmonic. And so the idea would be, hey, let's try to get short, drive back down to that V way up here. And then if we start making new highs, get out. Now, I'm not ready to do that going into jolts, but I'm just saying <laughs> that's what this chart's looking like right now. Right. And that all could change. We want to wait for that number at 10 o'clock. Yeah, I do expect it to be a volatile 10 o'clock. Yeah, we're getting close to that ten o'clock marker as we speak. Um, Tom, you want to just want to hit the poll question real quick now, or should we do it next segment? Oh, we could do it now. I think that's a good time to do it. So the poll question, thanks to Mike Burke, you had a great question. <clears throat> if bonds rally higher next week, next week, which market will likely get the biggest boost? Crude oil got zero percent. Smart, smart. Love that answer. Gold, 55% of you said gold, 11% said Euro FX, and Russell got 33%. Great question. That, that's a trick. Yeah, you know, Mike Burke's a tricky fella. <laughs> it's a tricky one. I, you know, I agree. I agree with gold. Um, I don't agree with gold. I mean, I, I agree with crude oil. I don't agree with gold, though. I think the correlation, we could do a correlation chart with bonds breaking and, and, and gold rallying. If bonds rally, I, maybe I'd expect a sell off on gold a little bit. I'm just thinking about what the recent correlation is. Well, I think is um, what 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 do bond you know higher higher bonds? If bonds rally, that means interest rates are going down. Right. Yeah. Or, or at least that's what the what bonds are anticipating. Right. So that means rate cuts. What will rate cuts do to gold, to euro, to Russell, to crude, crude kind of whatever, you know, crude is more of crude is more of a market that's indicative of of will they cut rates or not. Right. It's inflationary. But these are more reactionary gold, euro and Russell. So. Your correlation yeah, chart would help with all three of these, all four of these. Yeah, no, I know. I'm going to be thinking about this time now for the next <laughs> seven hours. <laughs> well, let's this wait till is... after the stream so we can focus right. and you all and right. I will tackle that this afternoon. All right, we'll take a break. We'll get right back. So you want to be a trader. Well, you should know you're not alone. Over the past several years, record numbers of people have set up their very own online trading accounts. There's never been an easier time or more inexpensive way for do-it-yourselfers to get started trading the financial markets. Better futures start now with the Ninja Trader mobile app with the power to customize how you trade on the go. You can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at ninjatrader.com. Technical analysis made easy. A starting place for new traders. When do I place my trade? Where do I set my stop loss or profit target? 
all good questions that traders need to answer on a regular basis. One of the ways traders get to those answers is by using technical analysis in a historical price chart. Join over 800,000 users who trust NinjaTrader as their futures trading platform of choice. Access the world's most popular futures markets and trade seamlessly across devices, including PC, Mac, or mobile. Get started with $50 margins and commissions as low as $0.09. Cents. Need support? We're available 24 hours a day, 5 days a week. Want to personalize your trading setup? Connect with our ecosystem of third-party developers, building trading indicators, and more. Visit NinjaTrader.com to get started today. Better futures start now with the NinjaTrader mobile app. With the power to customize how you trade on the go, you can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at NinjaTrader.com. Join over 800,000 users who trust NinjaTrader as their futures trading platform of choice. Access the world's most popular futures markets and trade seamlessly across devices, including PC, Mac, or mobile. Get started with $50 margins and commissions as low as $0.09. Cents. Need support? We're available 24 hours a day, 5 days a week. Want to personalize your trading setup? Connect with our ecosystem of third-party developers, building trading indicators, and more. Visit NinjaTrader.com to get started today. We are back. Let's talk futures. Appreciate everybody being here with us today. We have, I'm proud to say, happy to say as well, Dan Gramza, Gramza Capital Management here with us today. Dan, how are you? I am terrific. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing good. I mean, you look fabulous. Every time I see you, 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 you whether it's professional or social, you look fabulous. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure about that, but thank you. Last time I saw you in person, you you had lost all that weight, and you I was like inspired. Oh, I've been wow. working out, trying to catch up to you. You look great. I got to well, say, it. thank you, thank you. Yeah, I've I've lost a few pounds over the last uh, few months. Yeah, and you know what? When you lose a lot of weight, a lot of people their face gets really skinny, and yours is still as beautiful Pudgy. as I always remembered it. <laughs> Good. Good. Well, thank you very much. Wow. This is a great way to start. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in a good mood. So Dan, we're, you know, I, we were talking yesterday and I'm looking at these metal, these metal futures, these charts and, you know, gold just continues to astound me with these new highs every day, new highs, new highs, big new highs too, not little ones. What's going on? Well, I, I let's think about where gold comes in to choices, um, and if let's think about where it fits in in terms of perception. You know, what is it that attracts people to gold? Is it a supply demand situation? Not so much. It's more of a perception market. It's one that people feel is a barometer. Like if you have high inflation, where can you protect yourself? Uh, if the stock market's falling out of bed, where do you protect yourself? Uh, well, or if the dollar's super weak, where do you go? Gold provides that concept of an alternative investment. It's not based on interest rates because that's the other place money can go, right? In times of uncertainty, it can go to interest rates. It could go to commodities, it could go to crude oil, it could go to gold. So if we think about where it's positioned, all right, and where is the market? Is it a situation where people are 
comfortable and confident with the stock market or it's a little shaky? Are people concerned? All right, if they're concerned, then where does the money flow? And I think there is some uncertainty out there. That's one issue. Another issue when it comes to gold, though, is I think about central banks. Central banks have been the some of the largest purchasers since 2010. They have consistently purchased uh, gold. And not just the big banks. I'm talking about you know, Kazakhstan and some other co countries, developing countries that are also buying gold. And then, oh, Dan, think, Dan, yeah, go Dan, ahead. I'm sorry. I know. I, 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 I just let me interrupt you really quickly sure, here. Sure. Just, ex just explain why, especially the big ones, why central central banks would would want to buy gold. You know, I, I got to tell you something. I had a conversation with the fellow at the Bundesbank a number of years ago. I was over there for lunch, not work. But the idea of where does where does this market fit? Where does gold fit in in that regard? You're right. The last currency that was backed by gold was the Swissy, and that was 1999. So no currency is backed by gold. Hmm. And that's a traditional reason we had gold in the bank. You turn in a buck and you get something back for it. Hmm. But where does it fit in? Is there a psychological element? Then how much gold, which is what I asked them, uh, how much gold does the central bank need to have for comfort for the investors to, in the country to say, yeah, there's gold sitting there. That's a good thing. At least there's gold at the central bank. All right. How much does that take? How much gold should you purchase if you're a central bank for that? That's one issue, but you know, Jim, there's a bigger issue. And we're seeing the accumulation of gold by central banks for a couple of different reasons. One of those reasons, they want to get away from the dollar. So if I have gold, I can make a transaction with you gold to gold. I can take gold and convert it into another currency. And if we think about Russia, we think about China, they see what the U.S. can do if they touch U.S. dollars. And gold, well, doggone it, trades in dollars. Crude oil trades in dollars. So, you know, all these markets that trade in dollars, they don't want to trade in dollars. So if I'm a so, central bank, go ahead. So you could, so I could sell my, my crude in U.S. dollars, buy gold, and then sell that gold to Japan for yen, as an example? Well, if I'm a producer, yes, yes. But if I'm a producer of crude oil, and I go to you and say, hey, look, let's forget this dollar thing. Let's do a gold-to-gold -gold transaction. <clears throat> sell me gold. Don't sell me dollars. Don't, we're not going to settle in dollars. We'll do an equivalent. That would be one way to step around that. Uh, I can also convert gold into your local currency. What is it? Rubles? Sure. Let's do the transaction in rubles. Now, if you were, if you're India and Russia says to you, I'll sell you crude oil, $30 off of the global price. <clears throat> Huge discount. Well, hmm, how do we do that now? Yeah, I, I don't want to do it in dollars. So the, the central bank having gold now provides some flexibility. And in developing countries, the other factor that comes into play is they want people to have confidence in the country, in the central bank. And one of the ways to do it is to say, hey, look, we got gold. Does it really mean something in a way? No, but does it create that psychological element? You know, that's what's fascinating about gold. The precious metals are psychological trades more than they are a fundamental trade of supply, demand, that type of thing. So, so a little perception. bit of a, maybe like an insurance policy and also a, a transaction basis, but on the transactions, 
they're not loading up barges with gold bars and sending them somewhere. You get a, a deposit receipt saying, okay, this is now your, you own this. It's sitting in a vault in Switzerland in, or in New York. And uh, now it's yours instead of mine. Right. That's right. They're not actually going to load, you know, give me two bars or even, uh, they're, they're not going to do that. But what it does allow is it allows to convert gold into other currencies. And I'm not using the U.S. dollar to do it. Yeah. So that's where the flexibility comes into play. So if I'm in a country that purchases crude oil, I may be willing to trade outside of U.S. dollars. Now, let's go back to like 19, it's in the 70s. You know, uh, there was an agreement between the United States and Saudi Arabia that said, look, we'll buy our crude from you and uh, we'll do it in dollars. And Saudi Arabia said, sure, okay, we'll do it in dollars. That was the agreement. And now, not necessarily true. So gold is that bridge to allow transactions outside the US dollar and China and Russia do not want to use the US dollar. The sooner they can de-dollarize their transactions, they want to do that because we can touch it if they use US dollars. They use our financial systems and that makes them vulnerable. So would, is the reserve uh, status of the US dollar then in question eventually? The world's, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, I think, how many countries are we talking about? Uh -huh. That do it, right? We're talking about a handful of com countries uh, that are really want to get away from the dollar. If you look at the rest of the world, the greenback is still that benchmark that they can feel some safety in. You know, that the dollar's position, I don't think will change. <clears throat> Who uses it may change a bit, but the global point that you're bringing up, which is a great observation, I don't think changes that much. Because, and it goes back to perception. You know, some markets move because of supply and demand. Some markets move because of opinions of what we think may be happening. And <clears throat> some have interest because their the perception is they represent value. Gold, silver. Some people feel Bitcoin fits into that category. I don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, in gold's case, there's a perception there that people feel gold. But here's the thing, Jim, like any market, like any trade we do, we got to pay attention to its response to the perception. And, and an example that always pops up in my mind is, do you remember in 1989, August, Saddam Hussein visited Kuwait? Right when he invaded Kuwait, time of uncertainty. And in January, we're now sending military there. So, geez, we got this war starting. Who in the heck knows what's going to happen? I would say that would have a high degree of uncertainty. However, if you go back and look at gold, it traded like a base metal. It traded sideways. We didn't see the dramatic shift that you would expect. So was gold always a safe haven? No. Is that the perception? Yes. And if it's if it's going up, and if you and I are interesting in trade, interested in trading a market, well, then we want to be long. But it's going to have some bumps in the road too. Well, let's pull up. All right. So now that we have set that foundation and I, I won't, you know, we won't even talk about contract law in the U S and the UK versus everywhere else. When we talk about, you know, uh, the strength of the currency, that's a different conversation, but let's take a look at, I have a, I have a daily chart up here right now of, uh, of gold. And then I have an overlay of silver. So, um, I know it's going to be hard to see Dan, I'm going to expand this a little bit for you. 
Okay. Um, the gold is the is the colored candles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's the June contract. Mm -hmm. And on the right hand side is the scale. On the left hand side is the scale uh, for silver. And th that's just a black open high low close bar chart. And they at the very, very bottom, I have the uh, a 60 period correlation calculation. Oh, I like that. And as you can see, I mean, we're correlated, right? But to a different extent. It, it, it's the speed of the correlation. We usually don't think of it in that terms. But yes, do we expect them going back to perception? Well, silver is a precious metal and gold's taken off. Silver could take off. And what's interesting, if you look at over a long period of time, silver can have a tendency to lead gold. It can move faster than gold. So we see that. We also see an industrial component that comes into gold, to silver, that we don't see with gold. Although it is used in industry, our cell phone to have about $2.60 worth of gold in a cell phone. But what you see here is they're not marching to the same beat of the drum. So if you look at the silver, I, I really like what you put up here, Jim. It, it, it's, it's really just a, what a nice storybook to look at. Uh, very clever. And if you look at silver, how it moved, well, let's look at where it crossed over gold. Okay. So right, right there. Yeah. But th this is a relative scale, Dan. So it's, it's going to change a little bit, but I, I hear you. Right. But in, if in terms of what should be somewhat similar is the rate of change. So yes, you can make that tighter. You could make it looser. Yeah. But yeah. the fact is the amount of movement that we're seeing in silver is not the same kind of momentum we're seeing in uh, gold. So the, the, the flows that we've been seeing over the last few months have really led to gold, not to silver. And then if you talk to somebody on the street, they may know that 2000 is a big number in gold. Yeah. Right. More more typical investors would be more sensitive to gold than they would be to silver in terms of price references. And so if somebody said, gee, this thing's over 2000, ask them where silver is. And they, they probably won't know silver. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. So when we think about some of the dynamics that we've been talking about, when we think about central bank purchasing, for the reasons we talked about, they're not purchasing silver for that. They're purchasing gold. So that also adds some hidden momentum in that market. So they're not marching to the same beat of the drum. The rhythm is very similar, and you can see your correlation uh, coefficient. You know, it's fairly high, which is a reasonable expectation. But I think it's important that we realize that it isn't always going to be that way. So if you're buying silver because of gold, you don't necessarily want to look for the same percentage of move that you would with gold, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, yeah, no, that's right. And then it, and we had this breakout. This was a spectacular breakout a couple of days yeah. ago. I mean, we hit we, and really 2200 was the breakout number area, you know, not number, area. And it's been, this has been almost a little bit, when I see something like this, I'm like, all right, this is over speculation, maybe, but maybe it's not. Maybe this is, you know, once you adjust for inflation, this isn't as exaggerated as you think. That's true. That's true. So if we add that component in there, is this unreasonable? No. D does it, Wave a red flag, though. So this money, there's money going into gold. Agree? And because yep. you and I are seeing this market moving higher, then where is it coming from? Is it coming from the stock market? That would be a comparable investment, a risk on, risk off kind of trade. Is that the case? Well, if we're looking at gold, that could be one of the flows that we would see coming into it is from 
uh, another marketplace. It's coming from someplace. Interest rates. Well, if gold is up today, does that mean interest rates are down? I'm talking about price. Right. Yeah, Our, bonds are bonds and notes are breaking big time last two days. Yeah. So, so because we saw yields kick up a little bit and we're seeing the market respond to it, which is what it should do. Yeah. You know? And maybe the many, maybe the money on the sidelines finally is tired of being on the sidelines. Well, we got plenty on the sidelines to fuel our markets in general. So it could be, that could be another factor that gets a, added to this. And I, and there's also that anxiety level. You know, every market has at some point an anxiety level. It's when it's on the front page of the newspaper, well, or on the internet, that people go, "Oh my gosh, did you? This thing's over twenty two hundred. Do you have some gold? Oh, no, I don't. Hmm. Should I buy it now? You think? It it's got. I mean, I don't want to miss this, right? So yeah. we got that issue that we're going to see some flows coming into it just by the nature of where it's trading right now. And is that sustainable? Let me, let me ask you, I'm going to, I'm going to put up, if you bear with me a second, uh, if you bear with me a second, sure. I'm going to put a side-by-side -side chart of just to kind of make the point of, um, uh, of the Bitcoin uh, we'll, we'll use the CME's uh, nano Bitcoin for just, just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to pull up a daily chart here. Okay. And it's going to be, once I grab it with my mouse, my old fingers, hang on a second. I'm going to put it side by side here and we'll take a peek. Okay. Let's see, wrong chart, wrong chart. And here's the right chart. Let me put them side by side so you can see them. I know it's hard to see, Dan, uh, on the broadcast, but we're going to fight through it. You know, Jim, I can't. There you go. Perfect. I mean, they look similar up until recently. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. But, you know, I, when I think about gold, there's gold. When I think about Bitcoin, there's um, there's the CME <laughs> regulation. There's those type of things supporting that market that can create a, a comfort level. And if we look at what we're seeing today over the last few days, they don't seem too correlated, do they? No. And Bitcoin is truly a perception <laughs> market. It, it's one that people think this could be 100,000, 100,000. This is cheap. All right. So it's that perception, I think, that drives uh, Bitcoin more than uh, a, a reality that we have, that we know there's not enough corn to meet global demand. Therefore, corn yeah. goes up. Right. It's not that kind of market. Well, you didn't use the word tulips. Or, well, <laughs> it could fit in here. It goes back to that idea of perception. Right. Tulips is a great example, you know, of a market that is moving on belief. It's gone up so much, it's just going to continue going up. An amazing time. So is that what we're seeing in Bitcoin? What's going to support Bitcoin? Are people willing to buy the break? Are we going to see signs of that? We got a potential double top there, and that could be a longer term high for a larger break. And what's interesting, if we trade below that swing low, technically, that market's in a downtrend from a technical point of view. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and, these, and the daily moves are so huge in Bitcoin that that's, that could happen you know, in 24 hours. Yes. Yes. So, which means for Bitcoin, as <laughs> with any market, including gold, risk management is always essential. So, and it, the thing I think sometimes people forget about, just because you get out doesn't mean you can't get back in. You just have to mentally go over, well, gee, it was so high when I got out. I don't know if I can buy it again. Well, you can. It's just, where's your risk management? Is it going to work? Who knows? But the well, issue a, is how you manage yeah. the trade. 
that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a concept, right? So you know, Larry Williams was telling us uh, his studies of Jesse Livermore and how Jesse Livermore would invest. He would only buy when we made new highs, buy when you made new highs, buy when you made new highs, and that is something that psychologically goes against your thought. You you want to buy dips, right? You want to buy retracements. You don't want to buy new highs. But that was that was supposedly Jesse Livermore's success. Well, let's think about that. Does that mean it's going to work every time? No. And but we also have to add in here, what's your time frame? I mean, are you going to buy a new high for today? So by the end of the day, I'll be out. Well, you could be buying that high, uh, a market that may be coming down. I'm buying a high today because 10 years from now, I think it could be higher. It's a different scenario. Yeah. So volatility, I'm willing to accept if it's going to be in my retirement portfolio for, I mean, if you think about it, Jim, look at how, if someone would have said 10 years ago, 15 years ago, be, you know, or a young person who says, I'm just going to put money uh, in the stock market. Has it been volatile? Yeah, sure has. Do they need the money today? No, it, it's what's happening down the road that they're looking at. And that's the issue, I think, also at play here. So buying a new high, how long are you going to hold it? And that may be a degree of comfort, as long as you and I manage risk. Because if it fails, how do we decide where is failure? That's the key there. What is unacceptable personally, mentally? to my account and unacceptable and from just the amount of risk that I can take required by the trade. And I think oftentimes that gets forgotten. What is that your trading strategy require from risk management? If it's 1500 and I say, I don't want to risk more than 500. Well, one, I'm not trading your the strategy Two, yeah. if it needs 1500 at 500, I'm out because it's probably going to take me out, right? That whole issue comes into play too. Yeah. So buying yeah. new highs, that's interesting uh, that yeah. Larry mentioned that. Now, now that was in the equity market. And I'm going to argue the equity market's designed to go up forever, uh, you know, where some of the commodities might not. And, you know, gold, and really, Dan, gold is, it's a second rate metal. I mean, it, you can't use it for that much. It's, 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 it's malleable. You could hammer it flat if you want. Um, it's, it's overrated in the, in the history of the civilization. I, I, I don't know if I agree with you totally on that one, because it is a very unique product. We don't have anything like gold. You know, we don't have a substitute. We use copper for some electrical things, but gold is such a highly conductive metal that it provides some unique characteristics. And you're right, it's malleable. It allows all kinds of things from a manufacturing point of view. And they're even using it now in some medical procedures. So it's pretty unique, I think. What would you say right. would be more unique? Well, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's, I'm thinking about, you know, electrification of the US, but that's a whole nother conversation. We're up against time right now, Dan. Appreciate you being here with us as usual with your great insights and looking forward to seeing you again. Great. So am I, Jim. Thank you. Great to be with you. And I'm looking forward to our paths crossing again, too. Awesome. Well, it's good seeing you, Dan. Up next, we're going to take a quick break. But up next, we have Blue Putnam joining us live in a couple seconds here. Hang tight. So, you want to be a trader? Well, you should know you're not alone. Over the past several years, record numbers of people have set up their very own online trading accounts. There's never been an easier time or more inexpensive way for do-it-yourselfers to get started trading the financial markets. Better futures start now with the Ninja Trader mobile app with the power to customize how you trade on the go. You can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, 
crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at ninjatrader.com. Technical analysis made easy. A starting place for new traders. When do I place my trade? Where do I set my stop loss or profit target? All good questions that traders need to answer on a regular basis. One of the ways traders get to those answers is by using technical analysis in a historical price chart. Join over 800,000 users who trust NinjaTrader as their futures trading platform of choice. Access the world's most popular futures markets and trade seamlessly across devices, including PC, Mac, or mobile. Get started with $50 margins and commissions as low as $0.09. Cents. Need support? We're available 24 hours a day, 5 days a week. Want to personalize your trading setup? Connect with our ecosystem of third-party developers, building trading indicators, and more. Visit NinjaTrader.com to get started today. Better futures start now with the NinjaTrader mobile app. With the power to customize how you trade on the go, you can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at NinjaTrader.com. Join over 800,000 users who trust NinjaTrader as their futures trading platform of choice. Access the world's most popular futures markets and trade seamlessly across devices, including PC, Mac, or mobile. Get started with $50 margins and commissions as low as $0.09. Cents. Need support? We're available 24 hours a day, 5 days a week. Want to personalize your trading setup? Connect with our ecosystem of third-party developers, building trading indicators, and more. Visit NinjaTrader.com to get started today. Good morning, everybody. Let's talk futures. We are back live with Blue Putnam. Blue, good morning. Oh, good morning, Jim. Very good morning, actually. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. How, how's everything going up in the uh, northern eastern seacoast? Well, it's a cloudy day, but uh, further north, it's raining. So we're uh, we're in good shape. <laughs> Well, that's good. That's good to know. Now you're you're nowhere. Are you are you anywhere near Baltimore by any chance? By the by the bridge collapse, I'm about an hour and a half away. Yeah, I mean it's a pretty important uh, transit that that bridge collapse. But they're they, they are really working hard to clear it. They've already opened some small channels for tugboats and barges. Uh, uh, there, it's an amazing job. They're already they're already proven they can do it in in record time. So it is, it's a two a two yeah. step process, right? Step one is clearing the channel for traffic, for 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 bar, for the container ships, right? And then step two would be to rebuild the bridge, which my my guess would take a, a lot longer. Yeah, rebuilding is a matter of years. Clearing is uh, weeks and months. I mean, they the getting the uh, the structure, getting the main shipping channel open is is the hardest. Uh, they're getting some smaller channels that aren't so deep open, but the shipping channel, and then they got to get that ship moved. That's not so easy too. It's got, it's all kind of tangled up in it. Yeah. Right. And there's a lot of containers on it. It's, you can't get a crane probably, or maybe you could, I don't know if you can get a crane big enough to start peeling those boxes off one at a time. Oh, you definitely can do that, but uh, they got to figure it out. But uh, they got a crane there that'll lift a thousand tons, but today it's lifting a 350 ton piece of the bridge because uh, they cut wow. them in parts and lift them up. But that's the biggest crane on the East Coast. They brought it in at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. So do you feel like, um, you know, maybe the supply chain's not going to be 
really long-term impacted anymore? Probably not. I mean, uh, Baltimore was a very big port for cars, particularly Volkswagen and a few others. Some of the cars are offloaded outside of what the bridge did before you go into the main harbor. So it, it's not 100% affected. And then on the uh, export side, it's coal. And uh, that will maybe have a small impact on the coal price in India. I mean, that's what we're... But in terms of container ships and things like that, there's so much capacity and in, in excess capacity in ships. And there are many other ports up and down the East Coast that can handle the containers. So uh, uh, it's it's yeah. really a, a cars and a coal story uh, if you get, or the only big ones. Yeah, so we're, I'm going to brag a little bit about the Port of Carolina down here in Charleston <laughs> being the the deepest, the deepest port on the East Coast. And one of the earliest from the 1600s. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and we've seen a little, a little civil combat there too, but that's a whole nother conversation. And then, it's funny, we're not even talking about what we were supposed to talk about yet. <laughs> um, so let's kind of pivot that in that direction uh, right now. You know, I get a lot of questions about uh, this, uh, the equity, the you know, rather spectacular rally we've seen in equities in the last in the last few months, and. Um, is do they does do equities like high rates? Do they like low rates? Do they like cuts? Do they like hikes? What's going on here? Well, there's there is a lot going on. <laughs> so let's see if we can unpack a few things. Equities like low rates better than high rates, but not all equity indexes are created the same. So if you're just isolating on rates, uh, Nasdaq is the most sensitive because the earnings are further out into the future. And what do interest rates do? They help you value things that are going to happen way into the future. So uh, lower rates give you a higher valuation, high rates a lower, high rates a lower valuation. So when uh, when they finally raised rates in 2022, uh, NASDAQ took it harder. Uh, S&P was in the middle and Dow Jones uh, also got hit, but that's those are more mature dividend slower growing companies, so they weren't as bad off. So that's kind of the rate story. Um, but there's, you know, many other stories going on. <laughs> yeah, but and okay, so let's think about that for a second. So the Dow is an example. I would imagine that Dow companies um, have a lot of cash on hand for CapEx for, you know, reduce their borrowing costs anyway. So wouldn't they be better positioned than, let's say, your average you know, NASDAQ stock? Well, as an equity market, when you have a lot of cash on hand, it means you don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and it, I mean, if you really knew what to do with it, you'd put it into your company. Um, so what you do with it instead is you buy your stock back and other things. So, But a lot of tech companies have cash on hand. You know, okay. these aren't the tech stars of 1999 that didn't have earnings. These are mature companies that are printing money right and left. So there's cash across the board. And I don't I don't think that's the issue. Um, you know, if I mean, if you had a ton of cash and you wanted to grow your company, you could. And the fact they're holding the cash means they're not sure what they want to do with it. That makes sense. That makes sense. I know it's easier to plan for CapEx years ahead of time if you have big projects right and now it seems like as you pointed out on on let's take a peek at the chart on the right real quick uh ai seems to be the big thing well ai came in in 2023 and it really brought nasdaq back up to uh to where the dow and the s p because nasdaq got hit harder by the rising interest rates of 2022 and AI allowed it to catch up at a, you know, a very fast pace, and it completely caught up. Um, 2024 is really very different because the Magnificent Seven aren't so magnificent anymore, and they're not seven. Uh, you have the Magnificent NVIDIA, <laughs> okay, and um, Microsoft and, and Meta are doing okay, but, uh, you know, Tesla is, is declining and having a very bad day-to-day -day after telling us deliveries weren't working so well. 
Um, Apple is certainly struggling with people not, you know, upgrading their phones as often as they used to, and they deal with what the, the politics of U.S. and China. Uh, so, you know, Apple and Tesla have been underperformers in 2024. So, so, you, so some people say it's the fabulous four now. I'm not so sure. I just think we're, we're breaking up the magnificent. The band is broken up. Uh, <laughs> it's what's happened. Well, but at a certain point, doesn't, so AI in my mind is synonymous with machine learning, whatever that means. And doesn't that uh, kind of spread from the Magnificent Seven or Four to everybody else who adopts those types of techniques? Well, it does spread. So let's go back to your definition. I know AI and machine learning are very similar things. Uh, AI, is, as, we, as it came on, the scene was really a lot about text, machine was a lot about data, but it's all pattern recognition. Uh, and we've had these kind of pattern recognition tools forever. It's just, they've gotten better and better and better. Uh, and so we've just had another upgrade with our pattern recognition toolkit. The interesting thing about where does AI spread? Well, it spreads to data centers because AI eats data big time. So you've got to have bigger data centers. And what do bigger data centers mean? You've got to have more GPUs. You've got to have more of the computers in there, more servers. That's NVIDIA. Uh, and wait a minute. You've got to have more servicing. Of, you've got to actually cool these data centers. So some of the companies that provide cooling have, have seen their stock prices rise. So the biggest impact to date, aside from providing the chips, has been related to helping the uh, the revolution, if you will, in, in massive data centers and all the things that it takes to build them. And of course, they eat electricity like crazy. So that's going to be another issue. So uh, you, interesting you say that. There, there's that big facility I think they're building in Arizona, which ran into some roadblocks, and now it's pushed back a little bit further, right? It takes a long time to build these things, right? That's right. <clears throat> But once but, it's online, that'll be another stake in the in the ground. Yes, and companies are going to have to decide, do they want to own their data centers? Do they want to rent them? Obviously, the big players, the Googles and so forth, are going to want to own them, but uh, other players may choose differently. It's going to, it's huge business. Okay, but so that's interesting. But interesting that we're taking, we went from AI into actually the hardware and the compute systems. The companies that are trying to use AI to actually reduce costs uh, are the ones that are still, uh, they're, they're probably going to figure out how to do it, but it's not as easy as they thought. So do you mean like manufacturing companies? and Manufacturing companies, but also routine reports. Uh, you might have a credit agency and they have to write all these reports on companies. AI can help on that. But how much does it really help? How fast can it really? It can mainly do routine tasks. Let's go back to the pattern recognition. Most of the AI tools we're seeing requires tons and tons of data to learn. And then once it's learned, it doesn't learn anymore. OK, mm -hmm. so it's great for something like radiology. You have lung scans, you have MRIs, you've got tons of data. And so you can feed all this data in and you can build a machine learning or AI tool that can read a tuberculosis scan better than a doctor and just kick out the, you know, out of a couple of 10,000, they can pick out the hundred that need a doctor to really study. And that's hugely efficient. Um, but the key was there was a lot of data already existing. What AI has trouble doing, I'll stay in radiology for a second, okay. it can't it doesn't make good diagnosis. It can't figure out the treatment. It can figure out the problem, but the treatment's harder because a lot of the treatments are new. And guess what? A new treatment doesn't have a database. And so AI is quite hampered in those kind of things. But so, so we're going to be able to use AI, but the dynamic, making it adjust its pattern recognition as it goes along, learning something new. I mean, that's why if, if you're going to use AI for trading, you better be really careful. If you if you trained your model on zero rates, it's just going to lose a ton of money now. Uh, so, so it's so it's less predictive, right? So if you had 
let's say, um, you know, we, we have, we have the, go back to the doctor, right? The doctor has, you know, treatment A and the other doctor has treatment B and you're not going to get consensus and predict, is this going to be the right treatment for you? Because you don't have enough history of the new treatments. With, without a large data history, AI doesn't do much for you. So there are many applications for AI, but only if you have a large data history. And for some things, you just don't, like new treatments or, say, financial markets that central banks have just changed the game. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, from a, a layman's point of view, AI is simply chat GDP or Grok on Twitter, right? And chat GDP scrapes the internet, comes up with an answer. Grok scrapes Twitter, comes up with the answer. And the data is not always, it's, I always have to fact check. Well, you do because AI has an interesting um, ability to hallucinate. Uh, and, um, if you're in the fact business, like you and I are, that's a, that's a flaw. So we always have to check, but if you're in the creative business, like you're an artist or a photographer and you're doing all kinds of things, maybe making a movie with AI, uh, hallucination is uh, taking you off the charts, doing something different. Maybe it helps your, your uh, curiosity and your creativity. Uh, and there are ways, by the way, to control hallucinations, but mostly it's curating your data. So you don't just take a big pile of data and run it through AI. You, you, you clean the data so you're very comfortable with its accuracy, and then you use AI. On it. Turns out cleaning the data takes way longer than using the AI. Yeah, well, it's interesting. We'll see where it goes. I mean, it's not going to go away, right? We're going to continue to improve our, our our data analysis and come up with solutions. And uh, maybe a little bit of predictiveness will pop out of that. But um, let's talk about some facts, though. And let's go back to this whole, uh, forget about the rise of AI for a second. Let's talk about uh, the actual Fed funds rate and how they're related to uh, the, uh, NASDAQ as an example. Yeah, I, I like to use NASDAQ because it is the most, uh, the longest duration, most interest rate sensitive equity index. What, what kind of surprised me was bond yields, like the 10 year bond treasury yield, started rising in 2020 as we, late 2020, really 2021, <clears throat> as we came out of the pandemic. And, and NASDAQ didn't care. It was still responding to zero rates, quantitative easing, and those things. NASDAQ really didn't care about rates till the, till the Fed convinced the market it was going to start, start raising rates. And then, uh, you know, and then NASDAQ took a pretty big hit. However, we're in a different place now. We're, you know, we're at five to five and a half, five and a quarter, five and a half Fed funds. The Fed's, you know, kind of toying with us about when they might make the first cut and how many cuts. But I got to tell you, two or three cuts isn't going to make any difference to consumer behavior. It isn't going to make any difference to investment behavior. The economy doesn't care about small cuts. You got to do something really big. If you take it from five to two, hey, yeah, you're going to get a reaction with the economy. So I think we've shifted gears now to a much more earnings driven market. And as long as we keep creating jobs, we're going to keep spending money and the earnings are going to go up. So uh, we, we're in a, I, I think we've left the rate sensitivity or are leaving it, I should say, in terms so, of how equities respond. Okay. So we shouldn't really have a concern about um, corporate debt, right? Right now, I think corporate AAA effective yield is about 4.78 compared to maybe 4.45 last year. It doesn't look like it's moved a lot. And is that a factor in some of these companies? Uh, in the publicly traded companies, it's not too much of a factor. Uh, the, the yields are tight. Uh, credit quality is good. It's in the private credit area that you have to be very careful about. Uh, <clears throat> these are companies that are not public. They are partly at least not serviced by banks. And at least a trillion dollars has gone into private credit in the last year or two. I mean, it's just, it's the hot area. 
it's the hard area, hot area in part because private equity has slowed down. Private equity is when you basically buy the stock in these non-public companies through a private equity fund. Private credit is when you lend these same companies money. Uh, and by the way, since we're in a uh, we're trading futures and options here, buying private credit is like buying a call option on the assets of the company. If the assets of the company grow a big time, you're going to make a ton of money eventually, whether it stays private or goes public. Private credit is writing a put option on the assets of the company. If the company grows, the company grows and the assets grow, they're going to pay the loan back and refinance at a lower rate. You're going to get screwed. Uh, and if the company goes bankrupt, they're going to put the company to the private credit lender at exactly the wrong time. So the risks of these two kind of non-public investments are very, very different and are much more related to options than people realize, the people that are buying them, I think, actually realize. Uh, but they do tend to follow public markets with the, and they've outperformed public markets, by the way, in the zero rate days. I'm not so sure they can do that in the 5% days. But right now, though, with equity prices high, it doesn't make sense for the private equity guy to say, hey, let's go public. Well, if you read it, you pulled it off in, in pretty good style. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still a lot of uh, the private equity companies that can go public are the ones that have positive free cash flow. If you're still not profitable and burning through cash, it's it, that, that window for IPOs hasn't opened all that much, although it did for Reddit. But Reddit had the AI story. But what about Truth Social? Yeah, what about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the revenue is not there. The, ca the free cash flow is definitely not there. <laughs> uh, it definitely has a cash flow issue. And, uh, you know, that's the reality of the company, okay. but it, you, against the promises that are that are made. Yeah, um, yeah you're, you know, you're betting on the future there of that. You are. And, of course, that means you're buying a, a, a call option. Uh, you're, you know, yeah. you know, you pay whatever you pay up is that that's how much you can lose. And, uh, yeah. can you make a lot of money only if the future works out? Yeah. Well, going back to the chart here, you, you have a comparison between the NASDAQ 100 and the 10 year yield, not 10 year price, 10 year yield. Um, and it looks like there's, well, right now it looks like it's maybe back being correlated positively. I, you know, it, it kind of looks like that, but I there was a little correlation when the Fed was raising rates because that pushed the 10-year yields higher and the equities were going down. And there was another piece of correlation where the yields went up and equities went up. And that was after the Fed stopped. Mm -hmm. So that was the AI revolution. Um, I don't think, let me put it this way. I think equity indexes, NASDAQ included, have come to terms with a four and a quarter, four and a half, 10 year. And so it's got to move a lot to influence equities now. That makes, it makes sense. Um, That's my story know. that we're an, we've, we've moved into an earnings driven market and we're, we're not a rates driven market right now anymore. Got it. All right. Let's take a peek. Um, so, okay. So er, yeah, and earnings kind of got, in the last two years, earnings have kind of been not ignored, but not the story. And now you're saying this is now the story. I'm saying that, yes, the narrative is switching to earnings and it's going to separate different companies. If you were in the Magnificent Seven, you know, we had high earnings out expectations for everybody. Now we're getting very specific. Uh, maybe not for Apple and Tesla. Maybe yes for NVIDIA. Um, so where earnings is going to, uh, separate the stocks and separate the indexes. Um, you know, we, and the earnings, again, if, as long as we're not in a recession, if the jobs are growing, then that's going to be the narrative. If, if we go into a recession, then the narrative will switch on a dime, but that's not what's happening. So let's talk about, so, all right, let's talk about employment really quickly. You open the door a little bit for me there. <laughs> At what point 
Right. Jolts came out today and you told me that, you know, it was revised. The last report was revised. Today's wasn't so bad. Um, it seems like in general, the employment situation uh, is still pretty positive. Oh, it is very positive. Um, and uh, many of us, I mean, I never had a recession in my forecast, but it's still surprising me how positive it is. Uh, we're just creating jobs every month. We're bringing people into the labor force that weren't there or that left during the pandemic. Uh, and of course, when people have jobs, they spend money. So the economy keeps on chugging along. <clears throat> so I guess my question then would be, what would have to break in the economy for the Fed to, you know, step in and do something? Something would have to happen that caused jobs to be lost in a lot of industries all at the same time. Okay. You know, we, we did that with the financial crisis of 2008. We, we, we cut off lending to everybody, you know, and they, they had to cut back. We did it with the pandemic because we shut down, you know, the, the hospitality sector, at least in part. Um, but you have to have something that dominoes through so that we're losing jobs all at the same time in a lot of different places. We are losing some jobs now. We're losing a few in the finance sector. Uh, Citibank's laying off some more people. We're losing some in the technology sector. Some of these companies expanded a little too fast when they benefited from the pandemic and they got really big. And they're still bigger than they were in 2019 in terms of jobs. But they're you know resizing a little bit. But there's nothing out there that says our jobs are going to be lost in a lot of different sectors all at once. And 5%, 5.5% 5 .5 interest rates are not going to cause that. Okay. So then the dual mandate is only a single mandate for now anyway. Well, it's an inflation mandate right now because you can check the box. You know, I got two things to do and I've done one. The employment one is checked. Uh, right. But it's interesting as to which piece of data might be the most important. Some people are saying it's inflation, and they're the ones that are focused on when's that next quarter point coming cut on, on rates. And there are other people like me that, no, no, I'm watching the job market more than inflation because I want to know if there's any softness or uptick in consumption that could lead to profit growth or for the meter revised. So. I'm telling the, those of us telling an earnings story are still following the jobs market. Those of us telling the inflation story are just uh, myopic about the Fed. And I got to tell you, a quarter, half a point, it's not going to make much difference for the economy. Right. And, and three, three rate cuts is only 75 basis points. It sounds like it's more, but it's not. Yeah, it's nothing. I mean, I, you know, it's not nothing, but it's... Uh, in terms of your business and consumption plans, it's not going. It's in the era term, so it's not going to have much of an impact. So when you hear people say, "Wow, if they cut rates, it could overstimulate the economy," seventy-five basis points is not going to overstimulate the economy. And by the way, five hundred basis points up didn't hurt the economy. These people that think you can just dial the rates and, and change the economy are just all wrong. And that includes, you know, unfortunately, a lot of what we get from the Fed. They're not as powerful. Rates are not as related to the economy as you might think. Oh, that, it, Unless, that's... of course, they move big. You know, if we had 10% rates, I'd have to change this story. But, you know, a couple of points so, above inflation, no big deal. Okay. Well, so the new, so I was looking at the now casts. You know, everyone has a now cast, right? Um, Q1 2024, the New York Fed now cast was uh, as of March 29th was estimating it at 1.87% for GDP, but they had a one standard deviation calculation, which brought us down to about 0.7%. So within one standard deviation, you're 0.7, getting closer to that zero level. Yeah, but that's not what, I think the economy is doing better than that. 200,000 jobs a month, 4%, less than 4% unemployment. The New, un new unemployment insurance claims, very low. Job openings doing fine. No, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on with that particular now cast, but I'm not buying it. All right. All right. Well, they all have different ones. Atlanta Fed has theirs. I think Cleveland has a, 
theirs, I think, is is focused not on GDP but on on inflation um, or co- you know core PCE, PC, that kind of thing. Um, so they're all they're all trying to get into that. Maybe they're using their their AI to come up with these numbers. It would be I I don't think they are, but uh, they tend to take the numbers that they can already observe, and then say how to you know. So that's particularly like the Atlanta Fed. So what data have we gotten so far about the first quarter? And that goes into their real GDP, and we get a new piece of data, and they update it. Um, the Federal Reserves don't look ahead very. I mean, that's just not what they do. That would put them in the forecasting business, and they'd rather be data dependent. Um, we could build one for Ninja that would be data, you know, forecasting, and then we could be wrong too. <laughs> right. Right. Wow. Yeah. So Friday will tell, right? Friday we have, I think it's, you know, we used to call it when we were in the pit, unenjoyment Friday instead of <laughs> employment. Uh, unemployment was the report. Then somebody changed it to uh, be the employment situation because the word unemployment was too negative. That's right. <laughs> and, and that's Friday, I guess. That is Friday. Um you know, we've been on a little bit of an uptick in jobs, so uh, downtick. I uh, guess you can see uh, these things zigzag a lot, and they can they can zag twice before they zig. Uh, but I would say the odds are on a a little smaller number than previous months, just because it's a mean reverting number. Uh, so last question, we're running up against time, but last question on these numbers: Do you feel these are solid numbers, or they're a little bit sloppy in their genesis? They are a little bit sloppy, but you would not find the conclusion to be different if they were a lot more accurate. Okay. So the sloppiness is there, but it's it's not going to cause you to make the wrong conclusion. And by the way, you have four or five of these things. You got the payroll survey, you got the household survey, you got the weekly unemployment claims. Um, you put them all together to form your view, but right now they're all telling you the same thing. So, I mean, I can go into the deficiencies within each of them, but it won't help you forecast. Yeah, no, I know. And, and, and I didn't, I don't want to use the word rigged at all. Cause they're not, they're, this, the, you know, these are, uh, these are folks that are honest that do a good job collecting data the best way they can. I was a fed. I could attest to them. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, I mean, I'm complaining a lot about the owner equivalent rent, but they put that in in the 80s. You know, yeah. It wasn't something new for today. It just is the 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 fallacy and the problems are just now showing up. Uh, absolutely. Well, uh, we're up against time blue again, as usual. I appreciate your insights and spending time with us here. Looking forward to having you back on next week. Sounds good. Let's talk about commodities next week. There's a rally going on. <laughs> All right, let's do it. That sounds good. All right, everybody, we will, we're going to take a really quick break. And we have batting third in the lineup today, Anthony Drager, Tom Schneider. We'll be right back. So you want to be a trader. Well, you should know you're not alone. Over the past several years, record numbers of people have set up their very own online trading accounts. There's never been an easier time or more inexpensive way for do-it-yourselfers to get started trading the financial markets. Better futures start now with the Ninja Trader mobile app with the power to customize how you trade on the go. You can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at ninjatrader.com. Technical analysis made easy. A starting place for new traders. When do I place my trade? Where do I set my stop loss or profit target? All good questions that traders need to answer on a regular basis. One of the ways traders get to those answers is by using technical analysis in a historical price chart.
Join over 800,000 users who trust NinjaTrader as their futures trading platform of choice. Access the world's most popular futures markets and trade seamlessly across devices, including PC, Mac, or mobile. Get started with $50 margins and commissions as low as $0.09. Cents. Need support? We're available 24 hours a day, 5 days a week. Want to personalize your trading setup? Connect with our ecosystem of third-party developers, building trading indicators, and more. Visit NinjaTrader.com to get started today. Better futures start now with the NinjaTrader mobile app. With the power to customize how you trade on the go, you can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at NinjaTrader.com. Join over 800,000 users who trust NinjaTrader as their futures trading platform of choice. Access the world's most popular futures markets and trade seamlessly across devices, including PC, Mac, or mobile. Get started with $50 margins and commissions as low as $0.09. Cents. Need support? We're available 24 hours a day, 5 days a week. Want to personalize your trading setup? Connect with our ecosystem of third-party developers, building trading indicators, and more. Visit NinjaTrader.com to get started today. Welcome back uh, to Ninja Trader Live. Here we are uh, going to be meeting with one of our Ninja Trader ecosystem partners. This is Trader's Workshop segment that uh, in the past we've had its own show. Now it's part of the stream. We like to feature our Ninja Trader ecosystem partners. Today's no different. And it is my pleasure to welcome back Anthony Drager uh, to the show. How are you doing, Anthony? Good, Tom. Good to be back. Thanks. Uh, I should say Edge Trading Group. Forgot to put in your company there, um, but great to have you on. You were one of the first guests on Traders Workshop almost two years ago. Uh, we've kind of continued that theme. Now we have a longer, longer broadcast, but we're incorporating in. I was unfortunate to uh, not be able to meet with you last week, but I think Jim did a bang up job. Great topic last week. I think we should carry it on. It was a little painful with Jim, but we made it through. I'm only kidding. I like I've known Jim a long time, so. Well, you're a pro, time. so uh, I expect no less. Um, but everything good? Everything is good. I want to share my screen. I don't know if it's sharing right now. And just run through this slide and there have a go. conversation through some basic stuff that isn't basic for most people, if you want to do that. Sure. Yeah, let's go. Support and resistance on tap today. Yes, sir. Do I uh, share again, or is it sharing? It is sharing. Oh, good. So yep. you see my logo in the upper left-hand corner? exactly yeah all right so we talked about this last week and the first two bullet points is it's this is not simple stuff for people who never heard of it when you forget about when you're thinking about getting long or short start thinking about other people is the market long too long short too short other people's position so just we touched on this last week after someone is long they have to become a seller to exit that position should be pretty basic. So with that being said, if there's a lot of longs, there's a lot of sellers. And we're going to get back to that. Same thing only opposite with shorts. If someone's short, after they're short, they have to buy it to cover that position, exit that position. Whether it's a winner or a loser, doesn't matter. So if you, I used to say after you're a buyer, you're a seller and people started, it started to resonate with people like, wait a second. And then they go a little deeper. And that means like after you put on a position, now you become either a seller or a buyer based on the position that you're in. So it has to start to matter when you are trying to disseminate an opinion, when you are uh, trying to create your own support resistance lines, 
you you better start understanding where the market might be based on positions. Is it is it um, overly bought or overly short? Is it and and a lot of people worry about the seeing what everybody else sees, and and there's not as much of an advantage when you see what everybody else sees. Okay, but I want to get into the next two bullet points, which are simple but important. What makes price go up? More buyers and less sellers. Makes sense, right? Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But it isn't people who are bought it or sold it. It's people who want to buy it or want to sell it. Right. A lot of people just look at buyers and sellers after they shake hands, right? So when you see a hundred lot buyer come in and he gets filled, well, there's some importance to that, but not as much as if he's trying to buy it, can't get it trying to buy it, can't get it. So just keep it really, really simple. What makes prices go up is predicting where more buying might come in or else there's no opportunity to buy it at, at, at two and sell it at eight. And then just the opposite, what makes it go down more sellers, less buyers, but always remember people who want to sell it, not who sold it. It's not unimportant to see people who sold it, but it's more important to anticipate when selling is going to come in because that's what's going to make the price of whatever you're trading go down. And you're not going to put yourself in a good position to get short in a good spot unless selling's going to come in behind you or get long and hope buying comes in behind you to buy it at a worse price. Let me say one more thing, Tom, and then, and then you could jump in. When I was trading in a prop firm, within about a month, I had this epiphany. I'm looking at a chart and I'm seeing a, a, a market that was doing that was doing this. Let me uh, illustrate on my uh, on my uh, screen here. I seen a market that was just a simple rally. Right. And I'm thinking I'm looking to get short. But what makes me so special that I'm going to sell it here and it's going to come off and go lower and I could buy it for a profit down there. What makes me so special that I'm going to sell it and people are going to come in after me and sell it at a worse price, which means sell it at a lower price. Cause that's what has to happen in order for a short trade to be profitable. You need people to come in after you willing to sell it at worse and worse prices. So I'm thinking to myself, well, what would make me so special that I could get short up here? People would sell it down and I could cover down lower for profitable trade. And it hit me two things. People are trying to get long and getting long in this sequence. I mean, price is going up because people are trying to buy it, trying to buy it, trying to buy it, right? At some point, when most of them get filled, you could assume most of them are now in a position long and they have to get out. And going back to this first bullet, longs are sellers. If you find a spot in a rally, where too many people then get got long, you create the selling that would fulfill people coming in after you willing to sell it at a lower price. Right. Stuck longs. And and if you're not thinking of the dynamic of price action that way and finding tools that allow you to anticipate, you're not gonna pick, you're not gonna get consistent picking good spots. It's like if you want to be a good driver, you can't wait till the guy, you know sees his bright his brake lights to stop. You have to anticipate that the guy might stop. Those are good drivers. If you're not anticipating where this stuff's going to happen and why it would come off too many people long and they're stuck. And what do you use to see that? And then what could create that turn and then the top that forms. So, Sorry if I went on a little too long, Tom. But. No, no, no. This is great. So um, first of all, your first two bullet points, I know you talked about that with Jim last week, but really when when you exposed me to that almost two years ago, that was an eye-opening event for me because uh, you know, that just is not how I looked at the market, right? And I'm more a little more technical than than most people, but you know, from a from a be human behavior, supply and demand issue, you know, that was eye-opening. So thank you for that. The second two bullet points. What make prices go up? Price go. To, what makes price go down? You know that is classic supply and demand, and and you have a great analogy. I'll let you tell it. But um, we speak in terms of buyers push the price up and sellers push the price down, 
And what might be confusing to a new new trader is um, that is the supply and demand equation. It's not the will of the buyers and the sellers, right? We throw these terms around like buyers want want to buy at a higher price, right? Buyers stepped in and and move the market up. They don't want to buy at those prices, but it's just the matter of fact that there are more buyers than sellers. So the supply of buyers out 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 you know out uh performs or or is more than the demand of the uh, the price right or the 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 thing you're trading so price has to go up if there were no buyers then sellers are eager to sell and they would they would bring the price down but i think that's something that might be confusing in the terminology we use on a day-to-day -day basis buyers came and brought it up sellers came and knocked the price down not because they wanted to but because of the nature of supply and demand. And because they had to. And if you look at when someone is emotional, it's generally because they have to do something. And it goes back to positions. If you're short, you have to buy it. Yes. If you have to buy it, you're going to be less patient. You're going to reach and you're going to chase. You're emotional. The, the housing analogy. Um, one house, three people bidding on a house to buy it. And they, the, your, your wife loves that kitchen. She's emotional. I got to have this house. And three people are bidding on this house. Only one person is going to get it, but the other two were instrumental in where the price of that house went. And you could guarantee there was emotion in the bidding. Okay. I don't care if these people had a rational plan to only pay 500 grand for that house. It's going to go through there when the emotions involved. So when you have to do something, you're more emotional. That's why when you're looking at markets through the prism of other people's positions, you're starting to see and feel the emotion instead of your own emotion and what your position is. But when people are short, they have to buy it. Now, having known this and understanding what, like you're saying, uh, finding an imbalance of where you're going to have more buyers than sellers and more buyers that are jump in, jumping in, think about support this way. Because this brings me back to, Early in most people's trading careers, they learn a lot of nonsense and a lot of irrelevant stuff. It's not their fault. But they do learn about lines on a chart called support resistance. That's something I think people learn early on in their trading journey. However, they learn all different reasons why people come up with them. What you need to understand when support works, this is the dynamic at play. And don't let anybody tell you any different. If you have a line in the sand that support which means price is above it, and you anticipate price is going to come down in that area and then rally and bounce from it. That's what you would want to see if that line down here is support. What makes it work? What makes it work are more people that are down around this area that have to buy it. When you have buyers that have to buy it, you're probably going to have support. Now, what's going to create the dynamic of people who have to buy it? It's not going to be a mystery. It's not math. Think if you had when price ran up previously through this line, okay? What if you stuck a lot of people short in this area on the way up? So you have a lot of people that are short and stuck. They seen price rally against them. They felt that pain. They're on their knees. They're saying, "I'll get, if I could just get out of this trade for a break even, I'll never uh, take this much heat again. They, remember this, shorts equal what? Buyers. If there's a lot of stuck shorts here, you guarantee you there's going to be a lot of buyers that have to buy it that are begging to get out over here. All right? Short over here, stuck, come down, and there are buyers over here. Now it starts fitting into what you need to happen for support to work. So when we talk about support resistance and people are using moving averages and Fibonacci and profile, Again, that's fine if it works for you. But when those work, they're coincidentally working because you identified where you got enough trap shorts that create the dynamic of not just buyers, Tom, but buyers uniquely having to do something, which means they have to buy it because and, they're short. Go ahead. And, and Anthony, to that to that point, sometimes we talk about resistance becoming support or vice versa. And that feeds into that, right? So that area where you got stuck short, you saw all those sellers getting stuck short. Um, you know, there's there's orders being eaten up there. They come in, they short, they short, and there might be a, a, a resistance line. 
price can't go up higher. I want it to turn around. And then when it does and then retraces, that's where those shorts have to buy, right? So the idea of support becoming resistance, resistance becoming support, not coincidental in my mind. Right. And it's it's not it, if you have that dynamic where people are stuck getting short at resistance, let's say to your point, it prices down in here and this was resistance and it runs up. You're getting people stuck short, stuck short. It runs through them. And now you're creating the dynamic where you're going to stick shorts. It doesn't have to be old resistance, though, where you're going to stick shorts. You could stick shorts in a lot of places. So it's important to know um, where you got too many shorts in a market and what area that is, because that that's how you're going to start to compute better and more consistent support resistance levels. Remember, you could have the best lines on a chart in the world, but if you don't know why and where they come from, you're not, not going to be confident, and consistent in using them. What happens often is people have a line of support and they like it and they, they uh, want to get long and they try to buy it and the market comes up and runs away from them. So it worked, but they're not on the team. Next time it comes down, they get it, and it doesn't work. So it worked one out of two times, but you only played it the time it didn't work. That oftentimes happens where, where people are um, have good lines in the sand, so to speak, but they catch most of the losers and miss a lot of the winners. So it's not going to work for you, even though it works. So let me explain the real-time analysis of if you do have support, and it does have the dynamic of a lot of – stuck shorts at this line I just drew. Price is starting to come down to the area. Real-time analysis, you want to see more people start to get short in real time. You might have stuck shorts over here that have to buy it, but you want to see more people getting trapped, all right? More shorts, more shorts, more buyers, more shorts, more buyers. Keep saying that over and over again. Another thing you want to see is, or don't want to see, our longs. You don't want competition. If you're long, you don't want too many people long. Why? Because when the people are long, people are sellers. If you have a lot of sellers, is that advantageous for the price to go up? No. Well, if you're playing support and you're long, you want price to go up. So you don't want a lot of sellers. You don't want a lot of competition. So you need to start to look and analyze, are too many people getting long at support? Because that's not good. Um. Are we getting too many? Are we getting people loaded up on the short side? Because that is good. And we already have a line of support because we assume there are people who are short and stuck anyways. So let's say there isn't a lot of people loading up on the long side. Let's say there are people getting stuck short and they're already stuck short. That's going to give you your highest probability for price to do that off support. Now it doesn't become a guess. It's not random. It's not something you feel like you got right. It's it's a probability where you really start to say it's going to rain this afternoon and it does and it doesn't feel like a guess because you did what you do to predict it's going to rain this the, the in 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 the afternoon not that it's going to rain in five days you don't know what's going to happen in five days and neither do they but closer to real time you have a better chance of predicting what's going to happen but you better start looking at it through the eyes of other people and not through your own eyes I said this last week and i'll say it every week Stop making it your opinion. It's not your opinion as to what the market's going to do. It's the market's opinion. We're just reading it. As soon as it becomes your opinion, it becomes personal. You you uh, uh, are unwilling to admit that you're wrong. You get excited when you're right. I tell traders all the time, I don't want when someone is right and have a winning trade, you're not to cheer and jump up and down. You're not a cheerleader at a high school basketball game. You're supposed to be right a fair amount of times. What's more important is to not be wrong for long to strip out randomness, to look at the market through the eyes of other people's positions and stop reading a bunch of books on psychology and stop reading a bunch of books on all the magical things that make price do and uh, uh, do what it does because it's irrelevant. When it comes to it, it's all about too many longs or too many shorts. That's what's creating the imbalance of buyers and sellers that you spoke to. You have to know what's creating the imbalance in order to predict the imbalance. And most people don't know what creates it. If you don't know what creates it, how the heck are you going to predict it? You're not. And uh, that's where people get kind of like rabbit holed early on in, in a trading journey. So not their so, fault, but they go the wrong way the first way. Que question for you, Anthony. Um, <clears throat> how do people identify that imbalance? So we have a dome, right? They can pull up the super dome. 
and they can look at uh, depth of market to an extent. They can see where resting orders are. Uh, but is that something that's easily determined um, through a volume study, order flow, cumulative delta? Is that uh, is that helpful or are there other things we can look at? Well, it's not easy. And I used to use, we used to use cumulative delta, which is helpful, and but not as accurate. We started mm -hmm. to filter MBO data, which is market by order, as CME has put out for several years. And all MBO data is all orders that go in uh, uh, are described as a buy order, a limit order, market order, everything that it could describe it. It just doesn't describe and show you where stops are. But every other order is described with how big it is and where it's at and if it's a limit, if it's market and such. So that's not the secret or the advantage, but taking that uh, information and understanding every order has an ID attached to it and mm -hmm. being able to see how orders are put in and without going too far too deep, but we could create a sample size of when people are putting in a buy order, is that buy order opening up a long position? If so, okay. it's creating a sample size of potentially too many longs. Yes. Um, okay. It's not, I'm not saying that we certainly know everyone's position because I don't, it's just it's a sample size. So you still have to read it, but you're making better decisions with the right information of buy orders that go in, Tom get filled, and it's opening up a long position. Now it's a good accurate assumption that that is a long position. And when then you're able to add it all up, compare it to how many shorts, you get an imbalance of positions with then which then gives you an imbalance of future buyers and sellers. Does that make sense? It does. And and I think it's important to note too, that not every support or resistance level will have that imbalance that makes you, Anthony, say, aha, this is a place where there are more, a, a significant amount of, of buyers or a significant amount of sellers on the imbalance to make a trade or put an order in. Exactly. And that's disqualifying that level, which right. means you stay out of the way for the ones that work. You have to flip over the lines that you use to qualify them Instead of missing most of the winners and catching all the losers, you got to flip it. You have to miss some and more of the losers and catch more of the winners. And a lot of people miss winning trades and catch all the losers. You got to flip that by qualification. Now, what people don't want to do, and it makes sense, is what is a little bit harder. And what's a little bit harder is reading the market when it comes time to put on a trade it's not just put in your order to get long at 13 even and if it trades 13 quarter and rallies 10 points well just too bad you missed it by a tick no it's about reading the market to see what price qualifies whether or not you should get into the trade and exactly where so it's not it's not tick sensitive it's area sensitive but if you're not willing to read the market in real time you're going to have inconsistent results so you have to have fire in a ready aim fire progression right? You have to have an opinion, you have to have an area, and then you have to have something that gets you to pull the trigger because you sometimes don't want to pull the trigger. And disqualify, disqualifying a trade is going to be one of your better trades, you know? Mm -hmm. Saving money is like making money in this business. So you, you, you want to miss more of the future losers. Everyone's geared up to how to catch the big winner and, and everything else. The less sexy part of it is how to miss more losers. Right. And and it's having better lines in the sand and better support resistance, but knowing why support works when it works. And um, you're always going to have an imbalance of positions to find an imbalance of buyers and sellers. I think that people that hear that for the first time, ah, I'm looking for an imbalance of buyers and sellers. I should be looking for an imbalance of positions that gives me the imbalance of buyers and sellers. Right. Right. And, and, you know, you, you had a good example with the support level that, might hold when it's tested once and then it fails another time. And that's because that imbalance is dynamic. It is always changing. So just because you identify, let's say I'm making it up 9 a.m. that, wow, there is an imbalance here at 9 a.m. You come back to it an hour later, that imbalance is totally changed and, uh, you know, could have totally changed. Maybe it didn't change much. Yeah, but, that's why we look at stuff two minutes, one hour in the whole day. So we can mm -hmm. compare to see if it's still there or, or you know, over an hour over the day. But you're exactly right. It could have changed. Those people could have exited. And and just because you have an imbalance there that could be uh, subsequent support or resistance, that doesn't mean you don't have to qualify it. It's more important to qualify. You want to see more of that imbalance in positions. If it's support, you want to see more shorts getting stuck. You know, 
the, the profits have to come from somewhere and profits come from people willing to pay up. Right. If right. you flip a house, you buy a house, someone's got to buy that house higher at a higher price than you bought it. And you're giving them a reason to do that. You have to give people a reason to pay at a higher price than you got in. And you're giving them that reason. They're giving themselves that reason by getting stuck short. Right. Get them stuck. It's got to be painful for others in order to be helpful and profitable for you. Yeah. No, I, that, that makes complete sense. I like, you know, the flip side of your analogy, the housing analogy is if you walk into a development, there are four houses on, on sale and, and, you know, for sale and, and you're the only buyer, right? You're looking at that as uh, Hey, here's my imbalance. I'm, I'm in charge here. Right. Yes. That's good information to know before you've been on a house. How about this one? The realtor says, Hey, this couple's getting divorced. They just got to get rid of this house. That's right. But they're now what they're emotional sellers. You got to have emotional buyers and sellers. So when you could find that information, where do you find emotional sellers? People who are stuck long, yeah. stuck long, not just long, but stuck long because right. now they have to exit with a sell order, just like a divorce couple. They're emotional and they could care less. They just want out. People who are stuck long just want out. And if you don't believe me, just think about your own trades. Everyone's had the experience of being long, stuck and just want out. Right. Right. Think about how yeah. you feel in those moments. That's what you're trying to, to read when you look at a chart in your dome of others, because that's what moves the market. And, and when price moves, it's the chase. you got to find a chase. When Hey, listen, when a price doesn't do anything and it's just choppy and it's sideways, you know why? There's no interest to put positions on. Right. There's not many people long and there's not many people short. They're just trading against each other. It's not until you get that imbalance of position that's going to give you the imbalance to finally break out. So when it's quiet and choppy, it's because people aren't interested enough to put on positions. Less positions, less imbalance, uh, a chance of, a, of an imbalance for buyers and sellers. If there's no imbalance of buyers and sellers in the future, we're just going to stay sideways and, and uh, get others chopped up until you find that. And guess what? Sometimes it's news that could come across the wires that all of a sudden get people to chase to either open up longs or or chase to get out of their shorts, right? So that's why you got to be, or it's a stock. You know, NVIDIA has been a stock that's driving the NASDAQ. I tell people, if you trade the NASDAQ and you don't watch NVIDIA, then you don't trade the NASDAQ. Right. That's a stock that's moving the NQ, which is moving the ES. That's an right. important piece of the puzzle right now. That's going to help you execute in an area of support. You're like, not only did NVIDIA pop, but I'm also uh, long, let's say, the NASDAQ, and NVIDIA continues to rally. Now I'm comfortable in this NASDAQ position, but you're objectively being comfortable. You're not comfortable because the NASDAQ is just continuing to pay you. It, you're comfortable because an ancillary market continuing to drive higher, and now it's not random anymore, is it? Right, right. You've done your research. A Anthony, it's been great talking to you. We're running up against time. I could do this for a lot longer than we have allotted, but I want to thank you for coming on. How can people uh, get a hold of you if they want to continue the conversation? It's easy. Go to edgetradinggroup.com or search Edge Trading Group on YouTube and uh, either way, and you'll find out more about us and, and the community. Awesome. Great. Looking forward to our next conversation next week. Um, thanks for coming again. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back to wrap up the, the show with the midday wrap up with Mike Burke. So, you want to be a trader? Well, you should know you're not alone. Over the past several years, record numbers of people have set up their very own online trading accounts. There's never been an easier time or more inexpensive way for do-it-yourselfers to get started trading the financial markets. Better futures start now with the Ninja Trader mobile app. With the power to customize how you trade on the go, you can quickly and easily place trades with a single swipe and view index, financial, energy, metal, crypto, and more futures markets and access over 40 built-in indicators plus custom indicators all from your phone. Stay up to date at all times by enabling notifications. Get started today at ninjatrader.com.
Well, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, we're back for Midday Wrap-Up. I'm Michael Burke. I'm joined by Tom Snyder, CMT. Thanks for being here, Tom. Good morning, Mike. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Tom, I just want to get this out of the way. This is um, uh, one of the last segments where we're going to mention this. Uh, this week, we have our Guess the Close contest. Uh, you're guessing what the settlement price will be on this Thursday for the June S&P contract. You can send us an email at learn at uh, ninjatrader.com. Put guess the close in the subject line and your guess, and you can win a great package of Ninja Trader swag. We're not, we're not just giving away a cap here. We're giving away uh, some some real serious swag, uh, um, you know, wireless speakers, some travel gear, um, some really cool stuff. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, we won't be able to win it, but we're going to guess too. Uh, I'm going to wait a little bit though, Mike, to see what I'm going to guess. But we definitely want to enter our, our guesses before midnight Pacific time tonight. Correct, correct, correct. So yeah, I know that uh, a lot of people have already put in their guess that, you know, even even with today's down day, we could we could see a, a equal and opposite reversal tomorrow and they'd be right back in it. But uh yeah. one one email per person, that's the that's the rules. And uh you've got to get it in by midnight tonight. So definitely definitely uh, participate. It, it'll be fun and, and, and you'll win a bunch of cool stuff. Major market index are breaking much lower today. Um, it seems like a follow through from yesterday's reversal. What What do you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, no, no real good news. I think propping this market up. We're down, you know, uh, almost a percent on the E-mini, but everything else is down more than that. Uh, uh, including the Russell is almost down 2%, which Russell has been a little bit of the darling recently. And, you know, you could just see these moves through the pivots, uh, uh, you know, uh, S1, S2. I don't think we'll hit S3 today, Mike, but um, pretty big moves today. Yeah, let's look at that chart. This is uh, my five-minute uh, Russell. Uh, and and the thing, that, you know, that, that strikes you right away is that there really wasn't any any pullbacks here. Right. Mm -hmm. Normally, normally, you know, the market, you know, has its its pulls and its pushes. And there's, you know, and, and there's not a lot of big wicks here either. Uh, if you if you look uh, from where we opened here at 930, there's some there's some seller sellers wicks down here. Um, but, you know, that was really a that was a fake out because those sellers, uh, uh, you know, they you know, the buyers brought it back, but th there was just not enough of those buyers to keep it going. And we continued, we continued down, but most of this move happened pre-market. Right. And what's interesting to me, Mike, I think is, is we had a four day weekend in Europe and we didn't see a lot of, uh, um, I don't know, course correction because of Europe, right? Europe came in two o'clock in the morning and, and they were kind of happy with prices up around uh 21 25 and the russell they probably don't trade the russell too much um I agree. you know e-mini s p nasdaq might have seen a little more of a wiggle but this really was the u.s pre-open that moved this down so you know i i don't know what kind of uh, um, spooked this market maybe it's just follow through maybe there wasn't any news we know there wasn't any news till 10 o'clock in the u.s markets um but yeah, just just kind of continuation of yesterday. It just looks big because you know we're hitting those pivot levels. S two is kind of a well, you're you're near the ex not near the extreme. The extreme would be S three, but you're 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 heading towards the extreme. Right now, I think though we've seen a little bit of a consolidation past S two that we 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 might not get to S three today. I don't think we will. So that's a good point. I think if there's any good news here is that most of this move occurred on very low volume uh, through the globex session, right? So it wouldn't have taken much for somebody who wanted to move the market lower for them to move it lower during that period of time. And you'll notice there's not a lot of volume down there, which means that really either this was really well executed or there just weren't any buyers. Uh, and this market just just continued to go down through that through that entire session. Yeah, not a pretty daily chart. <laughs> so let's look at the daily here. So um, interesting, you know, we pulled back now to that twenty one SMA. So that's a really nice pullback on a couple of moves. 
Yesterday was a key reversal in both bars closing. Uh, Stan Eric and I were talking about the fact that this is a, a bearish engulfing pattern. It's also a key reversal pattern. Uh, and we were expecting some follow through today. And, and unfortunately, we were right. And that uh, 21 day moving average, you know, it has been acting as support, even though we do uh, see some instances where it closed below the 21. It didn't stay below the 21 for very long. You have to go back to, oh, I don't know, kind of the the early part of the year in January where, um, you know, that could be a rebalancing effect. It, it, it quickly righted itself when it hit that Ichimoku cloud. But for the most part, it's been it's been a nice support area for the Russell. Yeah, I mean that 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 rally from November into uh, in through December that was a good size rally. Uh, the pullback was really to the cloud. We kind of went through that twenty one SMA. That's probably about either a thirty eight point two or a fifty percent retracement from that rally anyway. So that was that was probably a, a pretty predictable level for that pullback, especially with the cloud right there. So you, you had a lot of things culminating in in that in that pullback. But yeah, to, today I'm, you know, there's, in my mind, there are three really whammies here for the Russell. One is that we're closing below uh, that that 21 SMA, which, which as you said, we've bounced back off of, off of it the last couple of times we actually closed below it. So that's encouraging, but we're below 2100 again, which, which I think is, is very bearish for this market. We're at 2080 now. Just don't, you know, it's possible this could turn around. Uh, today and get us back over there. That would be very encouraging. If we, if this market could turn around in the afternoon, get back above the 21, get back above 2100, uh, I think we, we uh, that might be just a, a good solid um, uh, pullback for this market. But um, we're still a few hours away from the close today, so it'll have to. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I, I think there's a little more downside here, um, only because I'm looking at kind of a, in my mind a supportive trend line from the low at the beginning of February to the low of about two weeks ago. And we're probably touching that right now. Um, so, you know, this, yeah, this, this might find some support, but that break of 2100, I agree is, is kind of uh, 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 not a line in the sand, but something close to that. I agree. And, and maybe, you know, we'll see us the same pattern that we saw earlier in the year. This will come back down to the, the Ichimoku cloud before we see that, uh, make it up again. And, and again, I, I think, that, you know, we're still in a bull trend here. I, I, I think this market wants to break out. And uh, so we'll, we'll see. Today will be interesting in the afternoon. I wanted to take a look at, uh, this is the E-mini uh, S&P 500 on the daily chart. Uh, what, what I thought was interesting is that yesterday we saw um, a, a gap up here in the VIX. It's the blue um subgraph that you see here the panel so that that big shift there on yesterday's kind of a, just a, a nothing down candle and an uptrend um that 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 yesterday spooked those guys on the on the uh on the options exchanges so th that was kind of a hint that they thought uh something was happening in the market to the downside and in fact we see that uh, vix has spiked up again uh, uh, it's been above 15 that's kind of neutral for those market makers. And uh, again, this is a pretty significant down day in the ES. And and generally about the rule, not the rule, but the thought is with the VIX, increased volatility in an uptrend, well, and starts to increase, that could show a, a rollover to the downside for, let's say, the E-mini S&P. Agreed. I mean, the VIX is how those market makers manage their risk. And so they're they're managing that downside risk by raising the option premium prices for the most part. And so that's what we're that's what we're seeing here. We did we haven't gotten back to that 21A, but this market had a pretty good separation from that 21 SMA for quite a while. So it it's gonna take a, another down day to get to that 21. I notice volume has been declining. It could be a factor of of the the holiday weekend or Easter break, but volume continues to be low during these moves. Do you do you think that maybe that'll give the bulls a little bit of hope that participation is low in these downtrends, and so 
maybe we're going to course correct back to the upside. I, I mean, my theory here is that the buyers are sitting on the beach in Key West. And so really, it's just the sellers here that are, are dominating this market. When those guys get off the beach and back you know, to trading, I think we'll be back on our uptrend. Do you get to Key West often, Mike? I've never been. Um, no, not really. Uh, we get we get sick of the drive and stop in Isle Morada, I've have been dinner, Isle Morada, and then turn yeah. around and come back. So yeah, <laughs> I, I get down there once in a while, but it's 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 a it's a it's quite a trek, especially on the weekend. It's very the traffic can be very bad on that highway. Isle and, Morada is beautiful, and I think a former president used to vacation there, right, George yeah. uh, George Bush. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah. there's a there's a nice lodge there called Boca Chica or Chica Lodge, something like that. Okay. Right on the water. Very nice. Nice. Uh, what are we looking at next? So this is this is the daily ES. Uh, I just wanted to kind of show that the volatility here in the ATR has ticked up the last couple of days on those big down days. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, maybe after the, like you said, maybe after this week, we'll, we'll see a pickup in volume and, and volatility. I think that's very likely. The other yeah, thing. Some, sometimes those things go hand in hand, by the way. Yes. Totally agree. This is the Dow. We're down almost 500 over 1%. Again, here, that 21 SMA is right where we're at. It's acting as a support here. Interesting how we kind of stop there. We You see the wick, a little bit of a wick below that, but buyers brought it right back to that 21 SMA. Again, the negative things here in my mind is that this could easily break and we could have another breakdown uh, breaking below that 21 SMA tomorrow. That would be bearish for this market. Uh, we're below 39.5. That's that's bearish in my mind as as well. And and notice your lower Keltner channel too. It traded almost right down to it today. Um, interesting that it's it's the the moving average that you have up there is is a longer term moving average, I believe, than your Keltners. But uh, towards the re, you know lower end of those Keltners, so. Uh, you, you might look at it one, one of two ways, right? You have, you've got support there with the moving average. You've got it with the Keltner channel, but we're so close to the lower end. It might not hold, right? Right. I, I agree. I agree. The Dow is one of those markets where you re, we haven't really seen less volatility. We've kind of seen the same volatility, whereas mm -hmm. everything else has lower vol volatility. Uh, this has had pretty much the same volatility, but on lower volume. So I'm not sure what that means, but you know the, this market um, again. You know when when this market's down 500 points, people pay attention. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at crude oil. I thought crude oil was interesting today. We we are right at 85. I think that is a a key level for this market. But we've had a nice little run here. Um, you know uh, through last week right we had we had the holiday so you know this is this is thursday we had a nice big run on thursday put us over 83 then we had the holiday we had a nice follow through yesterday and even more follow through today we've been above 85 sellers brought us back under 85 but now we're we're right back there again and we're breaking out of that keltner yeah you know this could be on uh concerns about the middle east and what's happening over there um, there is an OPEC meeting starting tomorrow. Uh, like Jim said, they're they're notoriously short, but also maybe notoriously uh, leaked kind of meeting. So this might be ahead of the meeting, understanding what the OPEC countries are, uh, their messaging will be, which we don't know, of course. But, um, you know, yeah, this is certainly looking for places to buy, not sell. Uh, 85 Nice level, nice round number, nice psychological number. Um, but you know that you could say the same for 86 or 90. So I'm <laughs> I'm kind of bullish. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is not good for inflation. This is not good for gas prices. Um, you know, the the guys, you know, that are going to that OPEC meeting are not our friends for the most part. You know, they they want higher oil prices. And um, you know, and 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 America's doing everything right here, Tom. I mean, we are the number one producer of crude oil in the world today. Yep. Uh, we've, we're producing more crude oil than we ever have in our history. And, um, you know, we always wanted to have that energy independence. We have it now, but uh, we, we still seem to be at the whim of, 
uh, some of these other kind of, I'm going to call them rogue, probably shouldn't call them rogue, but yeah. rogue oil states, you know, who do not have our best interest at heart. And I, and I think there is a little bit of a geopolitical politics going on, right? The uh, the sanctions ever since, you know, two years ago with Russia invading Ukraine, um, who can sell to who and who's not, who's who's buying when they shouldn't be buying, who's selling when they shouldn't be selling. You know, I think a lot of that kind of throws things up in the air. But you're right. It's uh, tomorrow's meeting, I think, will be a little informative. We might see continuation. We might see a turnaround. Who knows? But yeah, we're rooting for lower oil prices because that will keep help keep inflation down. Agreed. And, and if you are trading this, you know, if you are day trading this or scalping this market, you got to be careful on these these OPEC meeting days because a, a news report or something could come out um, at, at, at any time, surprise you and, and spike the market in, in one direction or the other. So just be careful and make sure you've got that risk management in place. Mm -hmm. Gold continues its march up here. There's a lot of good discussion with Dan Gramza earlier on, on gold. Like this, again, is a new all-time high uh, for the gold futures here. Just incredible. Uh, again, you know, it, this might, if you look at this chart, the last three sessions, and you could even go back, you know, a, a few more sessions after that, buyers get very exuberant here, <laughs> and they yeah. kind of feed on each other. They don't want to miss out. They spike it up, and then you know the uh, sellers come in and uh, and and push the market down. If this is central bank purchasing, um, you know they don't they don't really care about these little pullbacks. You know they're in it for the long run. They're they're actually buying gold and actually possess possessing at some point the physical gold. So they're not concerned about these little um, you know these what you would call I guess um, mohawk wicks here <laughs> right you know they're in it for the long haul and these are these are short-term sellers that are just taking advantage of that and, and and maybe taking scalping some profits on the downside yeah i totally agree and being a global market you will see more consistent volume i guess or or um you know more volume in the overnight and and european sessions so that could be explained some of the exuberance and pushback as as these trading desks, uh, you know, open and close throughout the day um, uh, globally. But higher highs, higher lows, you know, green bodies for the most part. Yesterday's would have been a doji, but it did tick, tick lower. Uh, but that's almost, you know, nothing compared to the range of the day. Uh, you don't let those those seller wicks fool you. You could have a succession of these. Um, it's, it's when I start to see the, the low, uh, get lower than the previous candle where I will start to think that this uptrend might be, uh, cooling, if you will. You know, there's a, there's a charting style, Tom, yeah. that kind of helps you <laughs> visualize these kinds of patterns in candlestick charts that, that. Ninja Trader customers can use it. In fact, I believe you're going to talk about that on Friday. Right. Friday, um, part of the morning live stream, Ninja Trader Live, we'll do a technical analysis explain segment on Heiken Ashi, which is a relatively new concept. Uh, and I say relatively new compared to candlesticks, which are centuries old. Um, Heiken Ashi is, I think, less than 20 years old. Uh, but basically, it, it modifies the candlesticks to help you understand the trend a little bit better. It gives you a clearer look into what might be happening in the trend. It's definitely not used for pricing, Mike. I know uh, we talk about, uh, you know, adjusting our charts. Well, this is another way to adjust the chart. And um, in addition to uh, uh, illuminating the trends a little bit better, it also can help you with your indicators, um, giving you maybe some, uh, clearer signals. And and again, nothing's 100%. Past performance is not indicative of future results. But for the most part, the Heikinashi chart can help um, clarify things. So we'll we'll talk about that on Friday. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea there is that as a trader, I'm always looking for tools that reduce the noise so yeah. that I don't have to think too hard about looking at the chart. And, and Heikinashi is one of those tools that can help with that. Exactly. Um, 
I, I was looking here on the daily chart of gold. Look at how thin the Ichimoku cloud is here. And you know, if I move forward, it doesn't really start thickening until we see this move here. So this move here, Tom, is is really what is creating this move here in Heiken Ashi a little bit later. But notice how thin that is here. And, and that that is a result of that long time consolidation in this market uh, through last year and early part of this year. And what's interesting is um, we won't test that thinness most likely, right? I mean, where we are now, we are well above uh, several support levels before we even try to get to the Ichimoku. Interesting that when it does start to thicken up, it'll be in an uptrend. So we have a greater chance of hitting it when we get to the thicker part of the cloud. But you're right. It's because there was just gold trends or it doesn't trend, right? It consolidates. And so the consolidation lasted long enough to give a thin part of the cloud. Let's look at one more market. I was looking at Bitcoin today, down $5,000. We're under 66000 uh, that's a that's a benchmark candle where we're, we cross below that 21 SMA. 70, I, I, you know, 70 again, one of those big round psychological numbers. That was a number where we were at for the last four or five sessions. Market didn't really know what to do uh, once it got back to 70,000 after that pullback after the all time highs. But now we now we kind of see what the market wants to do <laughs> with that 70,000 level. Um, it wants to break down. In fact, we, you know, if you look, we are breaking lower than that big benchmark green candle here, you know, just a few days ago. So I think that's that's pretty bearish for this market. I think we could see some follow through here, but definitely below 70, below the 21 SMA, below that benchmark candle just a few days ago. This market is is looking weak right now. And yeah, and and worrying, I think, if you're a, a Bitcoin bull is that ATR is increasing during this retracement, right? So um, that volatility is increasing, that you know, average true range, it's a range, right? So if the market starts to turn around, if that stochastics is falling out of bed, like it, it does tend to do on big moves down or up, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather have that ATR start to shrink, but with the big candles, like you said, taking out that uh, that green candle from a week ago, uh, or a little over a week ago, you know that's uh, it's pretty bearish here. So that next support level is sixty four thousand. We, we tested that a few times a couple of weeks ago. Um, we'll see if we bounce off of that, you know, tomorrow or the next day, or we break through that. A break through that, I think, would be bearish. We'd be back at looking at at much lower lower prices here. The problem, you know, in my mind here, Tom, is that there are very large traders um, who are using this market, very large holders of Bitcoin who can use this market to lock in profits or to speculate, um, that kind of thing. So, you know, it's 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 dangerous to, to swing trade this overnight in my mind. I think this is really a, a, a market where you want to day trade, but you have to be super careful that you don't put your day trade in just in, in front of one of these big traders. Now, what I'm seeing also, Mike, is if we get to that 64,000 level, that support level, it's almost looking like an upside down cup and handle. You might have to squint a little bit, but uh, that might give us a little bit of direction to, well, if it breaks 64, is it going to go past the Keltner channel? Probably. I mean, I can't say 100%, but if it gets past there, we've got the Ichimoku cloud. But what does that inverted cup and handle tell us? It might be a little bit lower than that as well. Yeah, I agree. So, Tom, we are bumping up against time here. Uh, tomorrow, we've got some great guests. Uh, uh, Jim will be uh, hosting Jimmy Iorio. That's always a great conversation about you know economics, how economics affect the futures markets. Jimmy's fantastic. And then um, you have Dr. Levy tomorrow in Traders Workshop talking about AI. Right, and and we're actually going to bring in one of her uh, uh, traders, if you will, um, to talk about the app, practical application of her theory that she's going to talk about. She has a couple of different topics for the for this month, and so uh, we're going to try that format, theory, and then application with a, with somebody else to explain that. Um, that'll be fun. And, you know, I don't want to forget bars closing. We're going to have Steve Rhodes to help me out this afternoon. Oh, that's right. That's today at 315. Don't miss that as well. 
So everybody, don't forget, guess the close, get that uh, entry in, learn at ninjatrader.com. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback, anything that we're doing right, doing wrong, things you'd like to see in the show. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Again, same email, learn at ninjatrader.com. Again, Tom, thanks for being with me. Mike, always my pleasure to speak with you. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. Good luck in your trading this afternoon. We'll see you at 3.15 at Bar's Closing. Have a good day. All of the symbols, trading ideas, and live trading are for demonstrational purposes and are not recommendations or trading advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. All of the information and opinions expressed by third-party guests are their own and are not necessarily those of Ninja Trader LLC. Trading futures involve substantial risk and may not be suitable for everyone, and trading futures can result in losses greater than the initial required margin. Traders should only trade features with risk capital. Risk capital is money that you can afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial security or current lifestyle. You can find additional disclosure information on the Ninja